emerged from the depths with a story he waited centuries to tell. So those two, those two places. Two weeks into the excavation, as winter closes in, one complete burial has been unearthed, and several others are still being excavated. The team's task now is to try to read the life history that is written in the bones. The first thing that we can do is take a look at the skull and some of the features on the skull that indicate he's a male. If you look at the area over his eye orbits, you see that it's fairly well developed and there are brow ridges essentially there. And that's a feature that you find in men. Women's foreheads tend to be a little bit higher. This one slopes back a bit, so that's an indication that this is a man. This is his jaw, his lower jaw, and you can see it's very large and robust, and his chin is extremely square, and this is another feature of a male. Next, they must determine the person's age at death. And if you look at the ends of his bones and his arms and legs, you can see that they're completely fused together. In younger individuals, you would see separate caps at the ends of the bones, and because those caps have fused on, we know that he's at least more than about 18 years old. We can see that his molars are all completely erupted here, including his wisdom tooth, and that usually erupts when you're about 18 to 21 years old. So again, another indicator that he's an adult male. Many other questions remain. What was life at Fort William Henry like for this man? What was the condition of his health? Most of the younger individuals had very severe arthritis. The only place where he has any significant arthritis is here in his right elbow. And this is the forearm. Uh, this is the bone where it hooks over your upper arm and allows you to move it back and forth like that. And if you compare the right elbow to the left elbow, you can see how much rougher this surface is here on the right. So this means he had a lot more action in his right arm, and because of the arthritis showing up just in his right elbow, it suggests that he's a right-handed man. We have another clue that he was right-handed because he's got wear on some of his teeth, on his lower jaw, and you can see it's beveled right on these cusp surfaces here. So he's probably clenching a pipe over on the, the left side of his jaw and that's what would have caused that kind of strange wear pattern on his lower teeth. And because he was clenching that on the left side of his jaw, he was probably right-handed. You would put the pipe in the left side of your mouth and use your left hand to take the pipe in and out. The French and Indian War was fierce and long. Yet the soldier's most constant enemy was not a bullet, but disease. Smallpox, influenza, and tuberculosis ran rampant. This group of skeletons is more sickly um, in worse shape than anything I've ever worked with. Um, I've looked at people as old as about 3,000 years old and modern, more modern populations as well. And yet this is the most diseased group. They've got the most injuries. Um, all the way around, there's more pathology here than anything. Although more soldiers died from disease than war-related injuries, the battle picture that emerges becomes increasingly grim. This soldier is an example of one that was shot. There's this depression that caused the bone to be crushed here, and another one at the top of the bone here. You can actually see the rounded depression of the musket ball. A lot of the soldiers that we found died from blows to the head. Here, something struck the soldier and punctured the bone, forcing fragments inside the skull and also fracturing it here down toward his eye and also running back toward the back of the skull. Diaries reveal that as the French attacked Fort William Henry, the British simply surrendered, too sick with smallpox to fight back. Then, without warning, a group of Indians allied to the French attacked and slaughtered the ill and injured men. The event was central to the novel The Last of the Mohicans, long thought to be an exaggerated account. If anything, it turns out, it was an understatement. 
studying these skeletons, we have found extensive evidence of this massacre, um, documenting the fact that atrocities were committed. Um, we know that there were mutilations and massacres on both sides. As part of this war, everyone was participating in this. This soldier was one that was beheaded, and we have the account of a French priest who saw the beginning of the massacre, describing one of the native allies of the French coming out of the casemates, which were the hospitals at the fort, and carrying the head of his victim. Buried underneath the floor of the casemates, there was a mass grave of massacre victims, and this individual was indeed beheaded. In the neck bone that we have here, there are a number of cuts slicing across the bone, and a final one all the way through the bone here across the top. And so we're fairly certain that this is the individual that's beheaded that the priest saw. The bones found inside the fort tell the story of the quick and ferocious attack. As part of the massacre, part of the picture we've been able to reconstruct is that there were mutilations on the body, and this included genital mutilations. There are cuts on the front of the pelvis um, in the area of the genitals. Um, in addition, we think some of the individuals were disemboweled, and there are cuts going all the way through the region of the stomach and abdomen into the backbone uh, behind the abdomen. And we have here a number of, of cut marks and damage to the bone from that incident. Today, forensic science reveals much about the hardships with which these young men lived, the horrors they suffered, and the savage ways in which many died. It can create a picture of a soldier who was over 18 and right-handed, a man who smoked a pipe, which he probably held in his left hand, a strong man who spent his days doing a lot of heavy lifting, his arms and legs free of arthritis, but his back in constant pain. His bones and those of his fallen comrades tell us much about what these soldiers' lives were like but we can never know their names. Forever anonymous, they belong to the ages. In 1861, passions deeply felt over slavery brought the young American nation into a convulsive civil war. North against South, brother against brother, they fought for four bitter years. When the terrible trial by fire and sword came to an end, more than 600,000 boys and young men had died. The National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. was established in 1862 for record keeping and follow-up care of the wounded. Here, Paul Sledzik has studied more than 2,000 bones of Civil War casualties. Although bone may appear rock solid, in actuality, it changes over one's lifetime, even over the course of a few days, in response to exercise, wear and tear, and disease. Bone is like any other organ system in the body. It's constantly replenishing its cells and changing the, the cells within it. One of the changes that we can pick up in the bone that's interesting, um, because it gets at what activities that the soldiers were doing are these changes in the upper part of the humerus. This is the humerus or the upper arm bone from a Civil War soldier and this defect here, this etched area in the bone is indicative of heavy muscle activity of the upper arm, probably lifting the 15 to 20 pound rifles and firing them, digging with picks and, and axes. The bones also tell of the savagery of battle. Although the wire was added later, this piece of shot was lodged in this man's leg for perhaps two months before he died. These three cranial sections show very well how bone responds following trauma. This is, this is a skull section, an entrance wound going to the inner part of the skull. And if we look around the fracture margin, uh, there's no bony growth, and we know this man died as a result of this injury. This man lived for a month with this cranial injury. You can see there's some discoloration around the corners of the fracture margin here. If we look on the interior part of the skull, you also have some deposition of new bones called a periosteal reaction. You can see some of the gray uh, appearance here. This is a new bone that's being laid down uh, during the healing and or infection process. 
And then if we advance the time even further and go to a similar injury in the, in the cranium, this man lived for 10 years with this injury, a shot fracture injury. You can see there's been um, very good healing occurring around, around the site. Changes in the bones show the effects of one of the soldier's deadliest enemies, infection. This is the upper leg bone of Private Julius Fabre, who was wounded at Deep Bottom, Virginia, on the 16th of August in 1864. He was shot just above the knee. The knee would be here. And his limb was amputated uh, the following day on the 17th of August. He lived for six years with this, uh, with this uh, femur becoming infected. You can see the change that's occurred. Let me show you a normal femur for comparison. And you can see the amount of infection that has set in on this bone. Later, Fabre required more extensive surgery as the infection spread toward his hip. For archival purposes, the museum routinely photographed amputees alongside their severed limbs. The first extensive medical encyclopedia on military casualties was made possible by these Civil War survivors. But it would take another major war before scientists could begin to put names to soldiers who had died. December 7, 1941. In the pre-dawn light, Japanese bombers appear out of nowhere. Sirens shriek, bombs explode. Pearl Harbor is destroyed. America is at war. Ironically, a war that took millions of lives would become the greatest boon to the fledgling science of forensic anthropology. World War II was the first war for which our service members had documented health records. By matching skeletal remains against known medical information, Scientists were able to gather enough anatomical statistics to understand the life history each of us has written in our bones. During World War II and Korea, we had the first opportunity as a science to really look at some good documented modern samples and develop some new techniques for determining stature and age on, on these men uh, that were killed during the war. Since we knew who, who they were, they were positively identified, we could measure the length of a femur or a long bone and plug that into the stature regression formula or make new stature regression formula from that. Now, with a simple wooden board and a set of mathematical equations, anthropologists could begin to piece together profiles of the dead. This bone is 323 millimeters long. And if we plug that into our stature formula, our regression formula for stature, uh, we know this is a, a white male. Uh, we come up with an estimate of about 67 and a half inches, uh, plus or minus an inch on either side. That would be the stature estimate for this individual. But there are nearly 90,000 Americans from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam whose whereabouts are still unknown. Some of their remains have been recovered but not yet named. Other soldiers exist only as charred and shattered fragments hidden in remote jungles. But these men and women are far from forgotten. The search for their identity is one of the great detective stories in forensic science. More than two and a half million Americans served in the Vietnam War, the longest war in American history. 58,000 died at an average age of 19 boys barely out of high school. The ferocious guerrilla combat mangled and mutilated bodies, often beyond recognition. The remains of over 2,100 of these young men never made it back to the United States. Many of the men were buried upon impact at crash sites in the jungles, or their bones lay undiscovered in the foliage decomposing from the intense, moist, tropical heat. After nearly 20 years in the military, 38-year-old Air Force Major Edward M. Hudgens was preparing to retire when he was sent to Southeast Asia in 1969. 
At home in Big Spring, Texas, he left behind his wife, Mary, and their four children, Stacy, Wendy, Jeff, and Doug. On March 21st, 1970, seven months into his tour, Major Hudgens was leading a search and rescue mission flying over Laos when his A-1 aircraft was hit by intense enemy fire. Other pilots saw his plane go into an inverted spin and crash, but they saw no parachute and heard no emergency beeper signals. There was never any uncertainty as to uh, my husband's death. Uh, the uncertainty was not knowing when they were going to bring him back. All we could do was wait and wait for the government to get permission to go in. They were supposed to go into the site one time about two years ago, and we were all excited about it. And then um, there was a change in plans, and they could not go in. And I, uh, I was absolutely devastated. It just tore me apart, and I didn't realize how much I had counted on that. Mary Hudgens has never remarried. Using her VA benefits, she went back to school, got a job, and raised her four children alone. When other kids my age have lost a parent, they have a cemetery and a grave site they can go to and they can commune with their parent, their lost one. We didn't have that. Hope for the Hudgens family lies thousands of miles away where scientists they had never met worked to find Ed Hudgens and bring him home. Hawaii's National Cemetery is known as the Punch Bowl. The stairs are flanked by stone walls etched with the names of thousands of soldiers who disappeared in combat beginning with the Second World War. Nearby, at Hickam Air Force Base, the U.S. Army's Central Identification Laboratory, Hawaii, Seal High for short, is one of the world's leading institutions in forensic science. The soldiers and civilians who work here have pledged that the unaccounted for are not to be forgotten. Currently, over 78,000 men and women are missing or unaccounted for from World War II, 8,100 from Korea, and 2,154 from the Vietnam War. Deputy Commander of Seal High is retired Colonel Johnny Webb. Okay, as we prepare to go out to sites to recover service members lost in previous wars, a lot of work has to be accomplished before the teams can actually go out and begin the recovery operations. Plain metal shelves hold thousands of files. In each folder are the medical and dental records of soldiers missing from the Vietnam War. Today, much of the information has been transferred into a massive computer database. The real research is done in this room to prepare our teams to go out and do the excavations, as well as to provide the information to the scientific staff to make the individual identifications. Before Seal High sends an excavation team into the field, they study the reports from the casualty data section for each missing soldier. They then research any information gathered from outside sources. Eyewitness reports from local villagers who may have found a plane crash or people conducting oil or timber exploration can prove invaluable in pinpointing the exact location where a soldier was last seen. Seal High recovery teams train in Hawaii before excavations begin abroad. A mock demonstration site simulates an A6 series aircraft crash with meticulous detail. 
Uh, here we have a lot of pin flags, different colors, yellow designating wreckage, red designating unexploded ordnance or bombs, and the blue is designating any life support material, uh, things that the pilot was wearing at the time of the incident. A 12 by 16 meter area is laid out in four by four meter units, so the team can document where each artifact is found. Dirt is carefully removed and brought to a sifting station, where it is sorted by hand through a fine mesh screen. The smallest fragment might make the difference in finding a soldier's name. The team is looking for anything that can be identified, either from the aircraft or personnel. Bones, ID tags, or pieces of a life support system. Metal detectors scour the site in hopes of finding scraps from the plane. In the field, the detectors are vitally important, as they also help locate any live ammunition still on the site. Mostly coral, just this band of red. Ground penetrating radar sends radio waves into the earth, which reflect off buried objects. Disturbance close to the surface. The surface profile has been disturbed recently. OK, we have an anomaly. We have metal object. Different types of materials create colored bands, which helps the team assess the likelihood of a burial. The first dramatic use is that when we go to Southeast Asia and, we're, and we have these witnesses to incidents that occurred in the 60s, these people are apt to be old. And what they do, they say, well, yes, I did bury him, I did bury the American, and I buried him somewhere around here, but it's changed. And then they might point to an area, it's a football field in size, you know? Maybe the body's there, maybe it isn't, but I can eliminate vast areas of it within minutes. After weeks and months of training, men and technology are put to the test in a once forbidden land. The jungles of Vietnam that claimed its victims more than two decades ago. Central Identification Laboratory sends teams all over the world to find the remains of service members who are missing or unaccounted for. Working in some of the world's most remote locations, the teams work tirelessly to ensure that they recover every piece of evidence. But two decades after the Vietnam War, crash sites are far from intact. Villagers have scavenged whatever they could find a use for. This piece of wreckage from a downed American airplane is being used as a blade for a plow. And now that plow may be hundreds of miles from where the plane actually went down. Seal High teams work closely with local villagers who might remember the crash or may have discovered some wreckage. The goal, to try to pinpoint the exact location of the crash. She said she, she saw 13 people she personally counted 13 people uh, that morning. The team compares the information they receive from the villagers with detailed maps prepared at Seal High to determine the coordinates of the probable crash site. Global positioning systems fix their exact position as they trek sometimes for miles toward the site. Head on it, right in the middle of it. Once the excavation is set up, work begins to find and clear the area of any ammunition. The work requires patience right. and precision and can be extremely Good. dangerous. Beauty! Okay, move on back. 
Live 40 millimeter shells litter this C-130 crash site. Once they are located, they have to be carefully removed and carried to a safe distance where they will be disposed of later. Clues at the crash site come in different shapes and sizes. When a plane crashes, artifacts and remains bear the unmistakable scars of the 600 mile per hour impact. Large guns are buried by the force of the crash. The plane is literally torn apart. Pieces of the fuselage are scattered in all directions. Deep in the jungle, another Seal High scouting team uncovers a button from a flight suit. Then, further digging reveals a remnant of fabric from the suit beneath the dense jungle foliage. In a high-tech war, soldiers are mangled by their machines. Finding an intact skeleton in Vietnam would be inconceivable. So every fragment is a vital clue. The most significant finds are human bones and teeth. All the remains found in Vietnam are brought back to the Seal High Laboratory in Hawaii for analysis. Sometimes, all the forensic scientists have to work with are mere fragments. From these, they must piece together whether they are human, and if so, the individual's age, race, height, weight, and ultimately, their name. To date, Seal High has positively identified 570 unaccounted for service members from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam return the remains to their families. Often, bones arrive with no clear idea of where they came from. Identifying those remains is Seal High's most difficult task. Many times, several portions of a skeleton arrive at Seal High, each reported to be the remains of the same missing serviceman. Seal High anthropologists must try to identify each fragment of bone and determine who it belonged to. When bones cannot be identified by the standard methods, Seal High turns to DNA testing to analyze the remains. But the test won't work on small bone samples. I will tell you that this is the only bone fragment on the table that is large enough and in a good enough state of preservation, we think, to yield DNA. Before the bone can be tested, a sample must be cut and measured. Mitochondrial DNA will be extracted from the bone sample and compared to that of a living maternal relative. Okay. What do you think, five grams? Five grams. We're gonna send this sample to Aftel, and in about four weeks, they should issue a report to us on whether or not they were able, they were able to sequence mitochondrial DNA out of this sample. Before any work begins at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory outside Washington, D.C., the bone sample must be catalogued and photographed. In the laboratory, before the process of extracting its DNA can begin, the exterior surface of the bone sample is cleaned to remove any contaminants. Then, a two-gram fragment is washed, dried, and pulverized in a blender. The powder then undergoes a chemical reaction that disrupts the cells and releases the DNA into a liquid solution. This incubates overnight with an enzyme which breaks up the proteins within the cells, leaving purified DNA. Mitch Holland is the branch chief of service and genetic systems. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is just like a, a fingerprint. Uh, what we do is we look along the sequence of the DNA, we analyze those regions, uh, we compare those regions to, say, a suspect, 
a family member. When we do that comparison, we're looking for inclusions and exclusions. We're looking for matches and non-matches. Scientists at the Armed Forces Lab have a two-fold job, to identify DNA fingerprints from blood samples and the more complicated task of extracting DNA from remains which may be decades old. In order to match the DNA fingerprint of a missing soldier, the scientists must test it against a blood sample which has been mailed to the institute by a maternal relative. The process of extracting DNA from old skeletal remains is such a significant advance in biological science that in 1993, one of its creators, Dr. Carrie Mullis, earned a Nobel Prize. Scientists had known of DNA since the 19th century, but the mysterious nucleic acid structure was not known until the 20th century. In 1962, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for uncovering DNA's three-dimensional molecular structure. There are two types of DNA. Nuclear DNA, which is found only in the cell's nucleus, and mitochondrial DNA, found in the surrounding mitochondria. The first type is not as plentiful as the second, which can endure in bones for thousands of years after death. In both varieties, DNA resembles a twisting ladder with cross rungs composed of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or A, T, G, and C for short. The prints in DNA fingerprinting are pieces of A, T, G, and C of varying lengths and arrangements. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother. Therefore, people related along maternal lines share identical patterns in their A's, C's, G's, and T's that non-related people probably would not. A match indicates a high probability of identification, but in and of itself is not 100% conclusive. To have a large enough sample to work with, scientists are able to reproduce or copy the DNA in a machine called a thermocycler, which synthesizes millions of exact copies of the DNA within a few hours. The process is known as a polymerase chain reaction. The sample is then carefully loaded onto a gel through which an electric current is passed. Ultraviolet light helps visualize the individual bars of DNA. Then several samples are loaded onto what is known as a sequencing gel, one sample per lane. The sample is then read by a laser, which runs back and forth across it several hundred times a minute. The information is then converted into a peak, which can be translated into an A, G, T, or C. When compared to the family reference sample, if the sequences are identical, they are considered a probable match. Over the years, remains alleged to be those of Ed Hudgens came to Seal High four times. Once from an unknown source, once from a Laotian native, and twice from his known crash site. The bone tested for DNA was from the Laotian source and was clearly ruled out by the lab tests. But some of the bones acquired from the unknown source aligned with fragments from the crash site. These can be certified as belonging to Hudgens. Artifacts at the site found near Ed's remains included his watch, a buckle from his seat harness, a dog tag chain, and a dime. An American coin deep in a faraway jungle. But it would be a single tooth, not much bigger than the dime he carried in his pocket, which provided the pivotal clue the scientists sought. When the cases come into the Seal High laboratory, if there are dental remains, they are studied by forensic odontologists. They look for any unique characteristics which would help match the tooth to a missing soldier. In this tooth, we see a root canal. In other words, the tooth uh, had the insides removed and was filled with paste. 
uh, and that matches very closely with what we see in the post-mortem x-rays. Other fillings that are easy to match are these single fillings on the lower teeth, here and here, as well as this series of fillings on the upper teeth. And so this is a good example of when we have enough evidence to work with, both anti-mortem and post-mortem, about how closely we can match the dental records. Teeth are x-rayed, and the information is directly input into a huge database of dental records. This represents the post-mortem image that we just took on the tooth. All the dental records of people missing from Southeast Asia and Korea are kept on file. The forensic odontologist enters the specific details of the tooth that has been found into the computer and begins to make a match by checking the tooth against the information in the records. This patient had fillings on a couple of teeth in the top right side. The computer checks the characteristics of this single tooth against the thousands of records in its memory. Each time it eliminates a record, it moves closer to finding a match. The forensic odontologist enters more information and the computer eliminates all but four records. This tooth could belong to one of four missing men. One more piece of information remains. This molar had a small filling in the bottom right quadrant. This information eliminates all the records but one. The team has made a match. Can you take this down to casualty data and tell them that we have a uh, pretty good hit on CAPME and I'd like to take a look at the record? Yes, sir. Thanks. Only a few hundred bone fragments, most less than half an inch in size, and one tooth can be said with certainty to belong to Ed Hudgens. For the family, it is enough. Whether transporting tiny, unidentified bone fragments from an excavation site to a lab in Hawaii, or finally sending a soldier with a name home to his loved ones, Seal High treats all remains with utmost respect. Arlington National Cemetery, the ritual is repeated every hour, 365 days of the year. Fallen heroes forever honored, yet forever unnamed and unknown. But one hero, once among the missing, has finally been found. He comes to eternal rest with a name, full military honors, and a purple heart. For Mary Hudgens and her children, Ed Hudgens' journey cannot be measured in years nor calculated in miles. He lay in the jungle for 26 years, and we now have put him to rest and with honors, and his, his uh, fellow countrymen have honored him and it brings it to a conclusion for us. Twenty-six years to the day after Ed Hudgens' plane crashed in the jungles of Southeast Asia, his children lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Dozens of scientists around the world have worked toward this day. Piece by piece, clue by clue, they have unraveled a mystery that tormented a family for more than a quarter century. The final chapter in this soldier's story has been written. A family is reunited. An incomplete circle is, at long last, closed. Ed Hudgens has come home.
Police in Connecticut begin to suspect a missing woman was murdered. But how can they prove it when they haven't got the body? After a 14-year search, a skeleton is found in a well. Is there enough left to determine what happened? A homicide investigation stalls until a dead man helps solve the mystery of his son's disappearance. Hiding the victim used to be the key to getting away with murder, but no longer. Even without a body, forensics can tear the fabric of lies and expose the bodies of evidence. A dead body, it's usually the first clue in a homicide. But without a victim, how can police catch the killer? Without a victim, how can they prove a murder occurred at all? In December 1986, Connecticut State Police were faced with just such a challenge. Hella Crafts, a 38-year-old flight attendant, had disappeared from her home in quiet Newtown, Connecticut. She left behind her husband, Richard, and three children. Her disappearance came as no surprise to Richard. Hella had recently filed for divorce after discovering he was having an affair. The Kraft's nanny, Marie Thomas, was worried. Her suspicions grew when she noticed stains on the carpet near Hella's side of the bed. She called Hella's best friend, who in turn contacted Hella's lawyer. According to state police detective Joseph DeStefano, Hella may have feared for her life. Hella explained to her attorney that if for some reason she disappeared or wasn't around any longer or something wasn't right and not to take it as being a coincidence that there was something wrong and she had asked her attorney please look into it that is exactly what had happened how he did disappear police questioned richard Krabs. though they knew his situation with hella was rocky he seemed an unlikely suspect besides his day job as a commercial airline pilot richard was a town constable sworn to uphold the law but as state investigators talked to Hella's friends, suspicions about Richard began to grow. When people were asking Richard where Helly was, he gave several different answers. At one point, he said she was visiting her mother. At another point, I believe he said she was visiting her sister. At another point, he said he didn't know where she was. Things that weren't consistent with what a husband would say if his wife was missing. That in itself, created some suspicion. Police had enough information to obtain a search warrant of Kraft's house, but not enough to charge Richard with any crime. They still didn't know if this was a criminal investigation or a wild goose chase. At this point in time, we had no answers. All we had were questions. They hoped to find some answers in the Kraft's bedroom. By the time they obtained the warrant, the room was virtually empty, apparently to get ready for new carpeting, but perhaps also to disrupt the crime scene. Meanwhile, Richard was on his way to Florida for Christmas and miles ahead of the police. Something happened here, but had the suspect erased all the evidence? Some of the furniture was discovered in the basement, before investigators could examine the bedroom, they called in a friend of Hella's to tell them how it was arranged. Okay. 
After the room was back in order, the forensics team found stains on one side of the mattress. Blood spatter expert Henry Lee was called in to interpret them. The first time when you hit somebody, usually don't produce spatter. You only can create a wound. When the blood star deposit around the injury area, from the capillary or the vein, now you have poor blood. The second time you hit it, then you have spatter. Lee was able to determine from the size and distance the stain spread on the mattress that the blood spattered at medium velocity. That told him a little about the weapon. We know it's some blunt object, but I cannot tell you that's a hammer, an axe, or a flashlight. Could be any type of this blunt object. One thing Lee and investigators concurred on, they had found the crime scene, and it suggested bloody murder. A faint pattern of blood on Hella and Richard Kraft's mattress was enough to turn up the heat on what was, until then, a missing persons investigation. Now, police felt that Hella might be dead and that Richard Kraft's had killed her. But the proof was scant, shaky. They were relying more on instinct than evidence. If Mrs. Kraft's was killed, where was her body? They'd have to do their homework. The next level of the investigation was a review of paperwork that we had found in Mr. Kraft's background, particularly his credit card receipts. On the roster of routine purchases, one line stood out. We found that Richard Crafts had rented a wood chipper from the Darien Rental Agency in Darien, Connecticut. Though it seemed like a shot in the dark, DeStefano's sergeant suggested that perhaps Crafts used a wood chipper to eliminate the body. DeStefano was skeptical. My immediate thought was things like that don't happen. They happen on television, but they don't happen in real life. He went to Darien Rental to see if it was even possible to use a wood chipper to dispose of a body. The rental agent showed him the chipper that Richard Crafts rented on November 18th, around the same date Hella Crafts disappeared. Okay, essentially what we have then, we've got all the material being fed in through this end. Right. And it's coming in contact with the cutters on the wheel over here. Yeah, which is spinning. Now, about how thick is that wheel? About, about two, two inches? inches, yes, sir. And that's solid steel. Yeah, it weighs about 900 pounds. 900 pounds. Those blades, one on either side. So once that, once that wheel gets moving, nothing stops it. No, not at all. The only thing that happens is whatever hits that gets cut. Yeah, you could throw a piece of steel in there. It wouldn't make any difference. It would cut it up. You say that opens up about 12 inches? About 12 right inches, yeah. So 1,200 RPMs with a 900-pound... A uh, piece of metal, two 12-inch blades. No way anything's going to stop that. Not at all. Though the massive blade could make short work of anything in its path, the hopper could only accommodate objects up to a foot wide. It would be impractical to dispose of a body that way, but not impossible. It seemed far-fetched. But while DeStefano was investigating the wood chipper, other detectives spoke with town workers to see if anyone had seen anything that might resemble a clue. A utility worker reported he was out in the early morning of November 19th. He saw someone operating what looked to be a wood chipper on River Road, adjacent to the Housatonic River. That chance observation propelled an otherwise stalled investigation attention shifted to River Road. When the investigators got to that location, they did in fact find wood chips on the ground. And exploring the area all the more, they found uh, envelopes with Helicraft's return address on them. At this point in time, we had the feeling that we've got something here that's, that's totally out of the ordinary. Investigators gathered 33 bags of debris from the River Road area. The bags were sent to the police station to be poured over piece by piece. Anything that wasn't a wood chip or a leaf was set aside. At first we would find one hair, and not knowing what to do with it, we 
took a bottle and we began, we put the one hair in the bottle. We would continue on, we'd find an object that was harder than wood but softer than stone. So we felt that we'll start another bottle for items such as these. Out of the mulch, a grisly scenario was taking shape. Based on these initial findings, a tent was set up to process evidence on site. Konstantin Karazoulis, the state's chief forensic odontologist, or dental expert, was called in in hopes of locating human dental remains. We would collect evidence and bring it into a tent, and we would put it through some water, through a filter, and look for things that were human, human parts. Circumstantial evidence was piling up. The blood in the bedroom, the wood chipper rental, the unidentified fragments in the wood chips. But there was still no body. And without a body, there was no crime. They needed to find something more definite. Investigators knew they had to turn the case around or a killer would walk. While evidence of a crime was turning up along River Road, police continued interviewing potential witnesses. One spotted a man with a wood chipper on November 19th on a bridge about a mile south of the River Road site. Divers were sent to the bridge to see what they could recover. The water under a bridge is the repository of all things broken and discarded. It's a dumping ground for vandals and a place where unwanted possessions are tossed and forgotten. Most are mundane, but sometimes the unexpected turns up. Dan Lewis was one of the divers. What we were looking for was anything that could have been used as a weapon. We were looking for anything that, any type of a container, and certainly any more uh, body fragments. Underneath this bridge, there's many parking meters, road signs, shopping carts, the usual kind of things that you'll find discarded off of a bridge. I mean, something like a chainsaw or a type of weapon would be totally out of place. When they came up with that, you know, we immediately knew that uh, you know, we may have something here that pertained to that case. Like everything else in this case, the chainsaw's connection was tenuous. The tool was sent to Dr. Lee's lab to see if a link could be made. Meanwhile, a mile north at the tent, Detective DeStefano was making a gruesome discovery of his own. I had just put some debris into the screen. I had rinsed it off, and my normal course was after I would rinse, I would go through it with my fingers just to make sure that it was totally rinsed. As I was going through, you develop a certain feel for what you're dealing with, and wood chips have a, have a certain consistency about them. As I went through, I felt something that didn't feel like a wood chip. It felt slippery. And when I held it under the light, I found it to be the tip of a finger. The evidence of the crime was becoming ever more apparent, but it still wasn't strong enough to prove Hella's murder or to name her killer. The pieces would start to come together in Lee's lab as the chainsaw was studied. The chainsaw deposit in the river must have a reason. We initially don't know what's the significance and the linkage. But by examining the chainsaw, we found tiny fragment of hair. Under a higher power magnification, microscopic examination, we made a determination that's human. Not only human, we noticed this hair was bleached and dyed. To Lee's assistant, Elaine Pagliaro, the bleached and dyed hairs were all too familiar. Over 2,000 of them had already been recovered from the wood chips and examined. The roots were of something we call paintbrush type. This paintbrush appearance to a root is characteristically found when hair is in tissue, and then that tissue starts to putrefy. 
and the chemicals from the putrefaction affect the appearance of the hair root. So it ends up looking just like a paintbrush. That's important in an investigation such as the Crafts case because it indicates that the hair was in tissue and wasn't from a beauty parlor and dumped alongside the, the road. The hairs were then compared to hair from the victim's hairbrush recovered from the Crafts house. They matched. The chainsaw was then taken apart. Inside the housing were blue-green cloth fibers and remnants of flesh and blood. The fibers were the same color and fabric as Hella's night clothes. The flesh in the chainsaw proved to be human, and the blood type matched Hella Crafts. Now it was a matter of finding out who the chainsaw belonged to. The serial number was corroded from being underwater, but Elaine Pagliaro was able to restore it. Because of the nature of the way metal is formed, the impression goes through several layers. So even if you scrape off the top layer, if you take away that scraped portion, you should be able to raise up the impressed areas below. She applied a chemical to the surface of the plate, which dissolved the corroded layers of metal, revealing the serial number. The number is E. Five nine two one six one six. All my career, I remember that number. The serial number was traced back to the dealership. The chainsaw had been purchased by Richard Crafts. The forensics on the chainsaw potentially linked victim and killer, but investigators still had to prove that Hella Crafts was truly dead. After combing the banks of the River Road site for more than a week, Dr. Karazoulis found the final piece of the puzzle. And as I looked down, I noticed there was an object. And that object turned out to be a human tooth. In forensics, this is the holy grail. I knew I had everything that I would need to make an identification of a human being. A comparison with dental records proved the tooth belonged to Hella Crafts. But it suggested more than that. Part of the jawbone was still clinging to the tooth, and part of the root was cut off. If this tooth were just removed, you wouldn't see this type of a fracture, or you wouldn't see bone attached to it in this way. So I believe that some, some force broke this tooth from its seat in the jaw and crushed whatever it was holding to pieces. That force could have been a chainsaw or a wood chipper. Richard Crafts could be connected to both objects, and now indisputably to the victim, his wife, Hella Crafts. The circle was closing in on the airline pilot. The condition of the tooth, coupled with the hair and skin evidence, was enough to allow the medical examiner to declare Hella Crafts dead, two months after she disappeared. Based on the trail of evidence, police reconstructed the likely scenario of Hella Crafts' death. On the night of November 18th, Hella was preparing for bed when Richard struck her with a blunt object. He got rid of the bloody sheets, but left telltale stains on the mattress and carpet. He had already rented the wood chipper, probably for some legitimate purpose. Then he realized he had the opportunity to kill his wife and used the chipper to dispose of her body. But he knew the opening in the machine wasn't wide enough to fit a human torso. That's where the chainsaw came in. This isn't something 
that you would do to an animal. It's just not something that, that you do. I mean, it's totally beyond the realm of what people do to each other. Only six ounces of material from Helicraft's remains was ever recovered. Less than one one thousandth of a human body. But it was enough for the police to make their case. Most people don't realize two things. Number one, the lens to which the police will go to investigate a crime. And number two, the power of forensics. Um, they don't realize the new developments that have happened within the past few years that have revolutionized forensics in, uh, in criminal investigation. It's, it's incredible what can be done now when you blend science with investigation. For his crime, Richard Krafts received a 50-year sentence. His unconventional way of disposing of the body proved to be his undoing though it took a battery of forensics experts to prove it. But not everyone has access to those resources. One woman's desperate search for her sister would consume 14 years of her life. Ava Dehart was looking for a good time, but she fell in with a bad crowd. Her circle of friends was a motley group of biker wannabes, a touch of menace in the otherwise sleepy riverside town of Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1982. They hung out at a place called the Joker's Wild, a loose-knit gang with too much time on their hands. Ava's boyfriend was the leader of the group. His name was George Pasalis, but he called himself George Sparta. He was a man who was more feared than respected. Ava had dated him for eight years. During that time, their relationship grew more abusive. Occasionally, she'd leave him, but never for long. On July 20th, 1982, Ava left her house to go to work at the Joker's Wild. That was the last anyone ever saw of her. After a day had gone by with no sign of Ava, her family contacted the Stafford County Sheriff's Department. Detective Billy Bowler explains the investigation. When the investigation was first uh, initiated, it was a missing persons report. Um, and our sheriff at the time was uh, chief of detectives and picked up the case. He followed through with, um, interviewed the family. He went to interview Pat Solis. Pat Solis produces a handwritten letter uh, that was confirmed through family members that it was in her handwriting. More or less a Dear John type letter, I'm leaving, they had a spat, uh, see you later, that kind of thing, I'm not coming back. If George knew where Ava had gone, he wasn't telling. Neither was anyone else. With no leads and no clear signs of foul play, the sheriff's investigation could go no further. I think Pat Solis, of course, was targeted as a suspect or an individual responsible. Uh, right from Jump Street, but they could they they had no one coming forward with any information. There was no, uh, we had no body, we had no forensic evidence, we had no Ava Dehart. And Ava's family had no consolation. Ava's sister Debbie suspected a conspiracy of silence among the gang at the Joker's Wild. She felt the police weren't taking the case seriously. She knew that if Ava was to be found, she'd have to go it alone. The attitude was a bit hard to deal with in the beginning because I would take them uh, a rumor that I heard or someone that said something and, and um, they would contact me again and tell me they'd followed up on it and, and then we'd go through this cycle, this whole roller coaster, emotional roller coaster of going to them and giving them information and then having nothing come of it. And it was very difficult to deal with. Debbie was relentless in her pursuit of the truth. Desperate to find her little sister, she bulldogged every member of the Joker's Wild Gang, pumping them for information, taking copious notes. She knew her only hope lay with the surly gang of bikers who said they were Ava's friends. But no one would talk. 
they were all afraid of George Patsalis. The weeks unfolded into years, but Debbie endured, even though she was forced to realize her sister was probably dead. My friends say that when I get resolve on an issue, that I, I don't let go. And I guess I'd wavered in my own heart and mind um, many times about what, I always knew that she was dead, but I'd wavered in my own mind about what could have happened. In 1996, a news story caught Debbie's eye, a story about a woman in a footlocker. Her remains were found in Frederick, Maryland in 1982, the same year that Ava disappeared. Identification techniques weren't as sophisticated then. The body had been misidentified, and the new identification was a, a young girl, 22 to 26, the right height, the right weight. Um, she was found within four weeks of my sister's disappearance and had been missing approximately, been in the trunk approximately for four to six weeks. And so I just really uh, had a very emotional response to that. The search for her sister would lead her to the largest collection of anatomical remains in the United States. In April 1996, renowned forensic authority Doug Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington applied his expertise to putting a face on the lady in the trunk. Well, that was then printed in the papers, and it turned out that Debbie DeHart, the sister of Ava DeHart, happened to see that in the, in the newspapers, and she thought, could that possibly be Ava, because Ava had disappeared in 1982. Encouraged by the preliminary description of the lady in the trunk, Debbie acquired Ava's dental records so Owsley could compare them. But sadly, the dental work didn't match. The lady in the trunk was not Ava Dehart. Debbie Dehart's quest showed no sign of ending. But the lady in the trunk provided some unexpected help after all. There was so much publicity surrounding it. There were TV people and, and media people pursuing me, and I did some interviews. And as a result of that, I started to get phone calls. People were interested again. And I got some anonymous calls, people with little bits and pieces of information, but information I had needed all along. After 14 years of pushing, Debbie finally felt like she was making progress. She knew this could be her last chance she hired private investigator Al Baker to help her follow up with the former members of the Joker's Wild Gang. We began uh, making contact with various people which De Debbie was able to provide us with the names. She, she had done that thorough a job as to know who was uh, part of this group, uh, how we could contact most of them. Nobody knew anything definite. Many were still afraid of George Patsalis. But one name kept coming up, Barbara Campfield, the woman who became Patsalis' girlfriend after Ava and who eventually married him. One woman in particular said she helped Campfield clean up some blood at the Joker's Wild after Ava's disappearance. At the time, Campfield told her that the blood was the result of a fight. It seemed that Barbara Campfield knew something but what? Debbie had already tried speaking with her, but got nowhere. Now Baker gave it a try. I started off by introducing myself to her, providing her my card, giving her phone numbers, and calmly explaining to her that we were now in the investigation with the DeHart family and that we were not going away, that this investigation would continue was not gonna stop, and we were gonna talk to everybody we could to try and find out where Ava was. Baker kept pursuing Camp Field. Realizing that Baker wasn't going to let up, she was persuaded to work out a deal. She began cooperating with Detective Bowler and the Stafford County Sheriff's Department. 
she directed them to an abandoned home site outside of town. Campfield told Bowler that on the night Ava disappeared, George Petsalis asked Campfield to help him dump something heavy down a well. He told her not to ask any questions. She never dared to. The well was pointed out to us. We subsequently uh, got a search warrant for the property, uh, went there with the assistance of the state police and the Orange County Sheriff's Office, and uh, called the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue folks to come help us actually in the excavation of the well. After making sure the conditions were safe, the fire and rescue workers were slowly lowered into the claustrophobic depths of the well. The hole was less than two feet square and 19 feet deep. Soon, the workers were hauling up buckets of soil and debris, years of accumulated leaves and dirt that concealed whatever lay below. Then the bones started coming out. They were laid on the ground beside the well so an anthropologist could see what they'd found and what was missing. It was clear the bones were human and female. Uh, we found a, a pretty much probably the best part of her whole skeleton in various pieces and forms as we brought those out. Really, they came out in uh, five-gallon bucket fulls at a time out of the well. It seemed the mystery of Ava's disappearance had been solved. But were these truly her remains? A comparison of the jaw with Ava's dental records confirmed the terrible yet reassuring truth. Debbie Dehart's sister had been found. Well, it's certainly um, better for us to have found her than to have never found her. Um, I don't think we realized how deep the wound was or how it would never heal if we hadn't found her. For the Dehart's and in the name of justice, Owsley was entrusted with determining how Ava had died. My role is, is to state what the facts are. And to do that, what you have to do is pay very careful attention to the skeleton, to the bones. And if you know how to read the bones, they, they just are, it's phenomenal what they can tell you. This, this particular skeleton of Ava DeHart, it, it tells you exactly what happened to her. And it also provides all of the, all of the clues that um, helped with the determination of her identification. Owsley studied every inch, scrutinized every fracture to try to determine the cause of death. Was she murdered elsewhere, then dumped in the well? Was she killed by the 19-foot drop? Or was she still alive, trapped, and left to die? The injuries caused by the fall were restricted to the lower half of her body. Fractures in the foot, the lower leg bones, the thigh bones, and the pelvis are the result of being dropped in the well. When she was dropped in the well, her feet hit the bottom, and that caused breakage of some of the bone. As the force goes up the shin bone, then it causes jamming at the knee joint. And in relation to this, then when you look at the distal end of the femur, these fit together like this, the force compresses into the distal end of the femur, and it causes this compression fracturing right here. From the condition of her remains, Owsley determined that Ava was probably dead before she was thrown into the well. This blow to the midface, where it actually broke four bones. It broke part of the right maxilla, the left maxilla, and both nasal bones. It just sheared the nasal bones off. And that's, that's telling you that it's coming from her right to left, but it's also going up because there's a slight oblique angle here in the nasal bones. There's no sign of a tool or any being hit with a specific type of weapon. This is something that apparently was done with a fist. There was not a part of the skeleton that didn't have some type of injury. It was, it was savage. That, that, that's, that's the only way that you, can, that you can classify it, because I think even the blow to the face would knock most people out. He was simply out to kill the girl. George Patsalis, now living in Florida, was charged with the murder of Ava Dehart. At the trial, Owsley presented Ava's remains to the jury. Through his forensic interpretation, she was able to testify against her killer. 
I think that Doug felt that um, the dramatic way that she died, that she would speak to the jury, that it would be Ava telling the jury, what it ha look what happened to me. And I believe the Commonwealth's attorney used those exact words. Look what happened to me. On October 8, 1997, George Petsalis was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. The case against Petsalis was solved through forensics, detective work, and secondhand accounts. But suppose a crime had no witnesses, no crime scene, and no trace of a body. In April 1992, a 13-year-old Chevette was towed into an impoundment lot in Louisville, Kentucky. There, it joined the ranks of other abandoned vehicles, awaiting their date with the crusher. At the time, no one knew it, but this car held a terrible secret. Everyone in New Albany, Indiana, knew that Eric Humbert and Jonathan Whitesides were the best of friends. They worked together in the U.S. Geological Survey, and they played together after work and on the weekends. So it only seemed fitting that John Whitesides was the last person to see Eric Humbert alive. On the evening of January 15, 1991, after a game of hoops with their co-workers, the two drove to the auto shop to drop Whiteside's truck off for repairs before heading home. But by 9.30 that night, Humbert still hadn't arrived at his house. Eric's wife, Missy, said she phoned Whiteside's to see if he'd seen him. Whitesides told her Eric had left just a few minutes ago and assured her he'd be arriving home any minute. But the minutes turned to hours. At 2 a.m., Missy called Whitesides again. Eric still wasn't home, and she was worried. Jonathan said he'd be right over. Eric never returned. Though Missy had spoken to the police the day after Eric disappeared, she didn't file an official missing persons report until two weeks later. Their relationship was becoming strained, and she thought Eric may just have wanted a little time by himself. But now she felt something terrible had happened. Eric was gone too long. He wouldn't have left his 18-month-old son. That wasn't like him. Detective Keith Whitlow of the New Albany Police led the investigation. We began interviewing co-workers. There was rumors that Eric may have had a girlfriend in another state. We checked with that person, and uh, she hadn't seen Eric. Uh, so his disappearance was pretty mysterious to everyone. Uh, not only was he gone, but also was his automobile. We had there was without a trace. But something of interest did come from interviewing Missy's co-workers. Many said that Jonathan frequently picked her up at work. Some claimed that Jonathan and Missy were having an affair. Suspicions centered around Jonathan Whitesides, but there was not the slightest evidence that anything illegal had happened, nothing to link him to any wrongdoing. The two may have been guilty of indiscretion, but there's no law against that. Months went by. It seemed the earth had swallowed up Eric Humbert and his car. Meanwhile, Whitesides moved in with Missy and her son. Then, in April, four months after Eric was reported missing, a white Chevette turned up in a state impoundment lot in Louisville, Kentucky. Unclaimed, it was about to be sold or scrapped. But they decided, as a matter of routine, to make one last check with the National Crime Information Center to see if this car was in fact stolen and whether they could have located owner. When they did, they got a hit on the car showing that the car was part of a missing persons investigation right across the Ohio River from them in New Albany, Indiana. We were really were very, very close to losing a very key piece of the puzzle. 
The car belonged to Eric Humbert. It was stripped of its tags. In the hatchback were traces of blood. Hey, look at that. Louisville detectives interviewed Whitesides, the last person to see Humbert alive. Do you know who killed Eric Humbert? No. He consented to a polygraph exam. Do you know where Eric Humbert is? No. He failed. Did you kill Eric Humbert? No. When confronted with the results, Whitesides admitted he knew more than he let on. He told police that after the basketball game on the night Eric disappeared, the two men drove to the auto shop to drop off Whitesides' truck. Afterward, they drove to Whitesides' house to work on another car. From there, Whiteside's story took a bizarre twist. He says that suddenly uh, Eric went into a rage and uh, accused him of having an affair with his wife uh, and produced a knife and that uh, an altercation, a physical altercation between the two men developed there in the garage. Uh, during the scuffle, uh, Jonathan claimed that Eric was accidentally stabbed in the throat, a wound which, uh, according to Jonathan, proved to be fatal. Jonathan panicked. He thought nobody would believe the freak accident. He loaded the body into the back of the Chevette, drove several miles to a remote spot on the Ohio River, and dumped it in. He couldn't recall exactly where he unloaded it. The police were skeptical of Whiteside's tale. After his statement, he was arrested while they checked out his story. It just didn't pan out. It just didn't seem logical. Uh, we even had officers simulate um, the combat that he had described, and we found it very difficult to believe that it happened the way that he said that it did. Unless the body turned up, the only physical evidence to prove or refute Whiteside's story was the blood-stained Chevette. The stains in the hatchback were consistent with the wounded body being stashed there. But one feature stood out. The trunk liner contained an unusual pattern five lines of blood shaped like a chevron. Some blood-soaked object had been pressed against the liner, causing the marks. They were parallel, so they couldn't be impressions of fingers. The stain was notable, but meaningless, at least so far. Under the hood, investigators found a large spatter of blood. In it was a bright green fiber. No one could explain how it got there or what it meant. Inside the engine compartment appeared what looked like human tissue. It was sent off for analysis. Forensics expert Rod Englert was brought in to study the blood evidence. He found the fine mist of blood on the distributor cap wasn't consistent with a knife wound. He demonstrates. What I'm going to do is take some blood here and let's say that the end of this eyedropper is the end of a knife. And let's say that it has gone into my neck and I draw it back to maybe stab again or I just pull it out very quickly. What well, it will cause is what's called cast off and cast off is a resultant pattern that you see there. Now if you put these two together as we have here, there's a, an enormous amount of difference between those two patterns. A knife wound creates a cast off that comes from one direction but what Englert saw on the distributor cap was multi-directional. And that only comes about through gunshot. To Englert, the cloudy mist of blood clearly showed that Whitesides was lying. That's the origin of that blood. In Indiana, the pattern of bloodstains in Eric Humbert's Chevette raised doubts that he was stabbed in the throat. More doubts were raised at the forensics lab in Oregon where the tissue sample collected from the engine was studied by Ray Grimsbow. Microscopic analysis revealed the tissue was human, but it wasn't from anyone's neck. The arrangement of the cells, how the cells stained, told us that it was brain tissue. It was not um, from the skin or exfoliated tissue from some other area. This was neural tissue. We had to figure out then, how does it get out of a, a neck wound? And logically, it couldn't happen that way. 
A closer examination of the car revealed a single bullet hole concealed at the base of the windshield wiper. Two small fragments were recovered and sent to Grimsbo. He confirmed they were fragments of a bullet and its copper jacket. But most intriguing was the single tiny green fiber clinging to the bullet. He didn't know what to make of it. One thing was certain. The car was the scene of a shooting, not a stabbing. Whiteside's story wasn't washing. Seeking the truth, investigators went to the garage at the house where Jonathan Whitesides was living, the garage where he said his friend had accidentally stabbed himself to death. The crime scene was now four months old. Would anything be left? At first sight, the garage looked clean. But soon, a nine millimeter cartridge was found. Days later, a 9mm handgun was retrieved from Whiteside's work van. It seemed Eric Humbert had been shot. The brain tissue and the trajectory of the bullet indicated he was shot in the head. But something was missing. Something didn't seem right. Well, we don't have a lot of blood spatter. Normally when someone gets shot in the head, we have blood and gore everywhere. In this situation, we had very little. So when we were able to identify that tissue, then as coming from brain, basically, the spatter, the bullet fragment, all tended to fit together. This person probably was shot through the head. And the question became, how, how'd that happen without getting it everywhere? Well, the, the small green fiber. I think that's when the little light went on in my head that we have a green fiber on this bullet. Bingo, that's why we don't have the blood. He had a cap on. The weave pattern of the bloodied watch cap could also have made the chevron-shaped marks in the hatchback. The evidence so far was compelling and consistent, but was it enough to convince a jury the victim was truly Eric Humbert? All attempts to find a body met with failure. Our body turned out to be a small piece of brain matter and some blood splatters. The forensics team performed a DNA test on the blood. Problem was, they had nothing to compare it to. To go forward, they'd have to work backward. Blood relatives share similarities in their DNA. The forensics team counted on this to approximate Eric's genetic profile. To identify Eric Humberg required just a paternity test, basically. We did a family history. We had his mother, his two uh, living siblings, and his son and his wife. And so we typed them with DNA, and we took the unknown blood and the tissue from the scene, typed it. To assure that the evidence wasn't contaminated, the DNA was tested simultaneously at two separate labs. The results were consistent, but investigators were still not satisfied. The forensics team needed to get DNA from both of Humbert's parents to be sure their findings were precise and irrefutable. Permission was obtained to exhume his father, who died several years earlier. DNA was extracted from his father's leg bones. The genetic codes from Humbert's father and mother were compared to the DNA from the blood in the Chevette. We were able to show that, beyond any reasonable doubt, that this would have been consistent with uh, a son of those two people. Even without Eric Humbert's body, the prosecution had all it needed to convict Jonathan Whitesides. The prosecution alleged that on the last evening of Eric Humbert's life, he went to Jonathan Whitesides' house to help him fix his car. He may have suspected that his best friend was having an affair with his wife but he couldn't have known how much his best friend wanted him out of the way. While Humbert leaned over his own car to show Whitesides how he'd made a similar repair in his Chevette, Whitesides pulled out a 9mm pistol and shot his friend execution style at point-blank range. He then loaded the body into the back of the car, disposed of it, 
and abandoned the vehicle. He thought that by eliminating the body, he'd eliminated all the evidence. He was wrong. Whenever a criminal enters or leaves a crime scene, he always leaves something there. He always takes something with him. And I, I think that's very, very true. It's just today we are much more capable of finding those things that they take and leave than maybe we were just 10 years ago. The jury deliberated only 45 minutes before finding Jonathan Whitesides guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. As for Eric Humbert, so far, his body hasn't been found. Eric's mother told me after Jonathan was sentenced, she grabbed me by the arm and she said, please don't quit looking for him. And uh, it's kind of ironic, every time uh, we get information about a body found locally or something, it's like nobody has to say it, everybody goes, you know, like, I wonder if that's Eric. And, uh, and not as of yet, it hadn't been, but you know, we're still, we're still in some way, we're still looking. Not too long ago, when victims went missing, killers went free. Today, the rules are changing. The laws of justice have allied with the laws of science. And even if the victim can't be found, chances are the killer will be. disappears, leaving behind a trail of blood. Investigators have their suspect, but without a victim, what can they charge him with? A shooting is reported, but investigators have no proof that it really occurred. Until they can sift fact from fiction, they haven't got a case. Is a missing sofa the key to a woman's disappearance? The prosecution can't rest until it can make sense of a series of odd clues. Murder is usually the most obvious of crimes. The victim's bodies mute witnesses to violence. But their silent testimony may go unheard when they disappear without a trace. Tennessee, a thriving southern city. Home of Beale Street, the Blues, and Elvis Presley. But in 1997, it played host to a deadly mystery. In the early morning hours of February 8th, a man arrived at a Memphis motel. He became concerned when calls to the front desk went unanswered. He went to check it out. Hello? The clerk Hello? appeared to be missing. Hello? He didn't see anyone in the lobby, but there was blood on the counter. The office security door was open, and Hello? he noticed more blood on the frame. Convinced something was wrong, he left and called police. When Memphis police arrived, they discovered blood outside the motel entrance. Smearing indicated something had been dragged across the pavement.
they found more clues inside. While the office showed no sign of forced entry, the cash register was open and empty. But a purse lying undisturbed nearby caught their attention. They didn't believe a woman would willingly leave it behind. The wallet inside still contained money, as well as a checkbook, credit cards, and driver's license in the name of Ricky Ellsworth. Alerted by police, the motel manager arrived and confirmed that Ricky Ellsworth was the clerk on duty. She said Ricky lived nearby with her husband, Don, and two children. A trusted, reliable employee, she wasn't the sort to just leave in the middle of her shift. Circumstances of the crime suggested more than robbery. Police suspected the clerk had been abducted. As police processed the scene, other significant details began to emerge. The office security door was equipped with a keypad, but it was open and showed no sign of tampering. Either someone had known the code or the clerk had unlocked the door. To investigators, that suggested Ricky Ellsworth might have known her abductor. Although police had begun to suspect foul play, nothing prepared them for what they found in an adjacent bathroom. There were signs of a desperate struggle and much more blood. The running sink contained a small flashlight and the toilet seat had been ripped from its hinges. Wet, blood-tinged sheets indicated someone had tried to clean the room. Not only had Ricky Ellsworth disappeared, but it now seemed she'd been seriously injured. Captain R.G. Moore, who led the crime scene unit, feared the worst. When we don't have a body and we don't know exactly what happened, we'd handle it just like it's gonna be a homicide case. If we process the scene, we collect our blood sample, we collect all the evidence we can find from the scene and just keep it until we see what we got. Investigators hoped the evidence would lead them to Ricky. A squad car brought the victim's husband, Don Ellsworth, to the motel. He said he and Ricky were happily married. He told police his wife was a kind person who worked with a Christian prison ministry in her spare time. Every Christmas, she baked pies for the prisoners. But Ellsworth said their marriage hadn't always been so tranquil. They'd once separated for two years, and she'd gotten involved with a man who assaulted her and went to prison for it. Ellsworth said the man's name was Michael Rimmer. After finishing at the scene, the investigators returned to the station to conduct a background check on Michael Rimmer. What they found in the files was chilling. Rimmer was a high school dropout with a history of drug problems and violence. In 1989, he was convicted of robbing and brutally assaulting Ricky Ellsworth. Details of Rimmer's previous assault on Ricky raised Detective Robert Shemwell's suspicions. His actions at that crime basically uh, mirrored what was happening here at the motel uh, with the cleaning up, or attempt to clean up the evidence. Um, we immediately began looking for Michael Rimmer. Meanwhile, detectives narrowed the time frame for Ricky's disappearance. They found a couple who had checked in with her at 1.15 a.m. But when two others tried to check out around 2.30, she wasn't there. Detectives located a witness who said he pulled into the motel at approximately 2.15, hoping to rent a room. But he saw a man with bloody knuckles behind the counter and left without registering. He also noticed a four-door maroon car backed up to the curb, its trunk and doors open. Based on his description, police put together a composite of the man at the motel. Using an identikit, a collection of facial parts and features that can be assembled as needed, the suspect's face came together. It resembled Michael Rimmer. 
Detectives then asked the witness to look through an album of more than 50 mugshots, including Rimmer's. Their hopes were dashed when he couldn't positively identify Rimmer as the man with the bloody knuckles. Detectives learned from a co-worker that Ricky had recently gotten a birthday card from a Michael in Mississippi. She took the card into the back office to read, but became angry and threw it away. It was becoming clear to detectives that if they wanted to find Ricky Ellsworth, they needed to find Michael Rimmer. They started at the auto repair shop where he worked. Nobody had seen him since Friday, the day before Ricky disappeared. He'd left his tools and paycheck behind. One more critical fact emerged. When we got to talking to the employees there, uh, this same maroon four-door vehicle was described as being Michael Rimmer's car. Um, so then we decided we need to track down and find out where Michael Rimmer got this four-door maroon vehicle. It wasn't registered to Rimmer. If it wasn't his, detectives wondered where he'd gotten it. His co-workers sent detectives to another friend of Rimmer's who told them that his own maroon four-door car had been stolen a month earlier, shortly after he'd last seen Rimmer. After four days, Ricky Ellsworth was still missing, and so was Michael Rimmer. Hoping for a clue to his whereabouts, police questioned his brother. Richard Rimmer said he'd last seen Michael on the morning of February 9th, just hours after Ricky Ellsworth disappeared. Michael had seemed exhausted when he arrived in the maroon car around 9.30 a.m. He asked Richard if he knew how to remove a blood stain from the back seat. Then, Michael pulled a muddy shovel from the car and scraped mud from his boots. Richard also told police that Michael claimed Ricky bought the car for him. She had visited Rimmer in prison after he claimed he'd found God. And Richard knew the two had met after his release. But somewhere along the line, the friendship soured. By now, two weeks had passed, and still nobody had seen or heard from Ricky Ellsworth. Detectives had lost hope of finding her alive, and their prime suspect, Michael Rimmer, still eluded them. They would have to find him and the stolen car if they had any chance of proving murder. I issued a theft of property warrant um, on Michael Rimmer and indicated in that warrant that when he, he was located, or if that vehicle was located, that it was to be uh, held for the Memphis Homicide Unit and processed. Detectives got a promising lead from one of Rimmer's former cellmates. He said Rimmer spoke of killing Ricky and burying her in Mississippi after he got out of prison. Rimmer's former girlfriend told detectives of a wooded area called Plantation Point near Arca Butler Lake in Mississippi. It was 45 minutes from Memphis. She said Rimmer liked to go there. Detectives headed to Plantation Point. They combed the area on foot, but didn't find anything. Then they called in Blackwater divers from the Shelby County Search and Rescue Unit, specially trained to operate by touch in dark, murky black water. The divers searched the lake. They didn't find anything either. Detectives were thoroughly frustrated. They chased down every witness and lead, but were no closer to solving the case or finding Ricky Ellsworth or Michael Rimmer. Now, they'd run out of options. In Memphis, nearly a month had passed with no progress in the potential homicide case. In early March, detectives got a phone call from Johnson County, Indiana. A sheriff's deputy there had stopped a maroon car for speeding. When he ran a check on the license plate, he discovered the car was stolen and there was a warrant for the driver. Michael Rimmer, sought for crimes including robbery and possible murder, had been arrested during a routine traffic stop. Detectives flew to Indiana, 
prepared to finally question Rimmer and examine the car for evidence. After obtaining a warrant, forensic investigators with the Johnson County Crime Unit searched the car. They hoped for solid evidence, but never expected to find what they did. Numerous receipts, uh, hotel receipts, pawn shop receipts, uh, restaurant receipts, um, showing Mike's every step from the day Ricky came up missing to his actual apprehension. Investigators tested the stained back seat for human blood. Results were positive. It was their first physical evidence to suggest a connection between Rimmer and the crime. Memphis detectives questioned Michael Rimmer over the next two days. He denied stealing the car or having anything to do with Ricky's disappearance. So far, all their evidence was circumstantial. Without Ricky's body, there was only one way to link Rimmer to her murder. The blood from the rear of the vehicle Michael Rimmer was occupying and the blood from the scene matched. Um, we had a problem though, we had to determine or show somehow that that blood was Ricky Ellsworth's blood. They had one chance a reverse paternity DNA test, which uses the combined DNA traits passed on from parents to determine the DNA characteristics of their children. Forensic scientists compared blood from Ricky's mother to samples from the crime scene and the maroon car. They matched. The test established a 16 million to one probability that blood from the car and motel came from an offspring of Ricky's mother. It was the final link police needed to prove murder. Michael Rimmer's guilt was written in blood. Based on evidence, police believe they know what happened on February 8th. Michael Rimmer drove to the motel sometime around 1.30 a.m., knowing Ricky Ellsworth would be alone. When he arrived, she let him into the office. There, Rimmer exploded into violence, attacking her, then wrapping her body in sheets. Afterward, he tried to clean the room, but gave up and left the sink running. Dragging Ricky to his car, Rimmer made his escape. Although her body was never found, police believe Ricky Ellsworth is buried somewhere near Arca Butler Lake. Michael Rimmer was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. While no body was ever found in the Rimmer case, police used blood evidence to prove murder. But in Cleveland, Ohio, police would have to build a case on even less. On Saturday, December 15, 1984, Cleveland police were called to the home of Ernestine Campbell. She reported that her brother, Henry, was missing, and she feared for his life, because she'd heard he'd been shot and his body hidden in an alley. She told police she'd last seen Henry the night before when he'd left home for a nearby after-hour spot. Officers searched the alley, but didn't find a body. In fact, they didn't find any signs of foul play. They drove through the neighborhood, but didn't see anything unusual. There was no sign of Henry Campbell, and nothing to indicate a violent crime had occurred. Officers canvassed the area, talking to residents who might have seen or heard something the night before. One witness claimed she heard shots and saw men running near the club. Another recalled hearing shots, but couldn't provide any other details. Still others confirmed shots were fired, but nobody admitted seeing anything. Police were frustrated. They had reports of gunfire and a murder, but couldn't find the purported victim. Homicide detective John Quayley, the lead investigator, 
recalls the odd circumstances of the case. Well, usually we're called to the scene of a homicide where we have a victim laying on the street or in a house, but we have a victim. Uh, and a lot of times we'll be able to get the weapon used in uh, a crime. With this incident, we were, a murder was reported. We went to the scene. We didn't have a body. We couldn't find the body. We couldn't find any evidence of blood or we didn't have a weapon. It was kind of starting without anything to work with. Police needed more information, so they returned to the Campbell house. Ernestine gave them a picture of Henry and more details. She'd heard that some people claimed they'd seen Clarence Barnes shoot her brother in the back. She said Barnes ran the after-hours club in his home and that there was bad blood between him and Henry. Hi, Miss Richardson. Sorry. At the station, people who had been at the club that night began coming forward. A woman named Jacqueline Richardson told investigators she saw Campbell at the club and that he argued with Barnes. When Campbell left, Barnes, who had a gun, followed him outside. She said the two men were joined by a third and walked out of her sight. Shortly after that, a woman ran into the club, screaming that there'd been a shooting, and Henry Campbell was injured. The other first two, or was Richardson went outside, where a passerby told her some men were chasing and shooting at another. She said she didn't see anything and returned to the club. Barnes was already there, asking everyone to leave. As the search continued for evidence of murder, Victor Santiago told police what he knew. No. He was the third man Jacqueline Richardson had described, and his account took up where hers left off. He said he'd seen the two men arguing outside the club and heard Barnes order Campbell to leave. According to Santiago, Campbell caught up with him a few moments later. As they walked down the street, he heard a shot and Campbell fell forward. Santiago said he took cover, then watched Barnes fire three more shots at the prostrate Campbell. Police now had two eyewitness accounts, but still no evidence of a homicide. Henry Campbell had disappeared, and detectives had two eyewitness accounts of murder, but no body and no evidence. Several residents claimed Clarence Barnes bragged that he'd burned Campbell's body and that nobody would ever find him. Investigators brought Barnes to the station for questioning. He admitted having words with Campbell and asking him to leave, but said he didn't know what happened after that. He denied having anything to do with Campbell's disappearance. When police asked Barnes what he did for a living, he told them he worked at the Animal Resource Center at a local university. That immediately rang a bell in Qualey's mind, and he called Barnes' supervisor. We asked him if he had a, uh, an incinerator in the, the school. And he said, oh, yes. And he, we asked him how big it was. He said it was big enough to incinerate a steer. We told him then that we uh, were investigating a ho homicide and that possibly there may be human remains in the incinerator and asked him if he would seal the room. He did. The next morning, detectives and a team of forensic investigators went to the Animal Resource Center, believing they might find the remains of Henry Campbell. While the facility director arranged access to the incinerator, the security chief showed them surveillance video from the night Campbell disappeared. 
it showed Barnes arriving around 3.30 a.m. He backed into the receiving area, which was approximately 15 feet from the incinerator entrance. Police could see him carrying something toward the incinerator room, but couldn't identify what it was. The picture then jumped away and came back, and then the next picture was the incinerator door open and Clarence pushing a cart in there. You could not see what was on the cart, but we knew he was in the incinerator room at that hour. When investigators saw the incinerator, they knew they were in for a long, complicated task. Dr. Elizabeth Balraj, coroner of Cuyahoga County, recalls the challenge. And there were 100 gallons of cremated ashes uh, containing um, uh, the remains from various animals. And we had to sift through those and find a very small amount of human bones. If human bones were to be found at all. The team began the painstaking process of sifting through the incinerator contents. Using a fine mesh screen, they collected fragments of bone and other unburned debris. Though most of the fragments were tiny and charred, some appeared to be human, including a vertebra, mandible, and part of a pelvis. They also found a piece of melted lead. Its size and mass were consistent with a 38 caliber bullet. It was the first solid evidence of murder. Although investigators believed they'd found Henry Campbell, their case would go up in smoke if they couldn't prove it. They turned to Dr. C. Owen Lovejoy, a biological anthropologist at Kent State University and an expert at identifying altered or damaged remains. He applied his skills to making a positive identification from the incomplete and severely damaged bone fragments. Lovejoy concurred with Dr. Balraj that approximately 160 of the recovered bones were human. The next step was determining whether they came from one person and whether that person was Henry Campbell. The process would be complicated by their condition. Here, the pieces of the puzzle, all of the edges had been frayed, as you will, by the cremation process. And so none of the pieces fit together, and we had to look at them in an isolated state. After a thorough inventory of the fragments, Lovejoy determined that portions of an entire skeleton were present. No bones were duplicated. That told Lovejoy the remains came from a single individual. But was it Henry Campbell? Next, he would try to establish specifics about the individual. Investigators had recovered part of the pelvis, which is diagnostic for both sex and age. Lovejoy concluded the remains belonged to a male, approximately Henry Campbell's age. While detectives were closer to proving they'd found Campbell, they needed positive identification. But Lovejoy couldn't give them that, not without more to go on. Whenever we have a candidate individual that we believe the skeletal remains might match. What we do is we try to get a pre-mortem x-ray. Investigators delivered existing x-rays of Henry Campbell to Dr. Lovejoy. Could they help him prove murder? As Cleveland detectives sought to identify the bones found in the incinerator, Dr. Owen Lovejoy compared post-mortem x-rays and bone fragments with Campbell's radiographs. He focused on the skull, hand, and mandible. One recovered cranial fragment had a BB embedded in it. That matched an x-ray taken when Henry Campbell had accidentally been shot years earlier. Lovejoy also identified shared characteristics between Campbell's other x-rays and corresponding bone fragments but he found the most compelling correlations in the lower mandible, or jawbone. And the outline of that jaw, the details of the bone structure, and the details of the root areas where the, where the teeth had been prior to death, all uh, were configured in such a way that they indicated that this was a positive identification. Since the jaw figured so prominently in that identification, Dr. Elizabeth Robinson, the team's forensic odontologist, reviewed Lovejoy's conclusions. In her opinion, two significant findings bolstered his analysis. 
The end of the jawbone was flat, a unique defect present in Henry Campbell's jaw. A second anomaly, an area of intense calcification, clinched the identification. And it was in exactly the same area that it was on the postmortem as on the antemortem. It was also only five millimeters in size. In other words, it's exact same size, same area, and on both x-rays. With the positive identification, investigators have literally pulled proof of a homicide from the ashes. On December 21st, less than one week after Henry Campbell was reported missing, Barnes was officially charged with murder. Based on the evidence, police believe Barnes followed Campbell from his after-hours club, shot him, then hid his body. Later that night, Barnes took Campbell's body to the Animal Resource Center, where he incinerated it. In April of 1985, Clarence Barnes pled guilty to the murder of Henry Campbell. He received 15 years to life for aggravated murder. In Cleveland, police had to sift their case from a pile of ashes. In Maryland, investigators followed a winding trail of clues to capture a killer. Rockville, Maryland, August 10, 1988. 17-year-old Kai Lau returned early from a California vacation at the behest of a family friend to check on his mother, Lisa Tu. He hadn't heard from her in nearly a month, and others told him they hadn't heard from her either. That wasn't like his mother. When he and his mother's friend found no sign of Lisa in the house, they contacted police. They went to the Special Investigations Office at the Montgomery County Police Department to report her missing. Uh, Detective Turner? Yes. Kai informed officers that nobody had seen or heard from his mother for a month. Yes, the reason I called is... He said that his stepfather, Gregory II, might know more, but he was overseas on business and Kai didn't know how to reach him. Before Gregory left, he told friends that Lisa had flown to San Francisco to visit a friend in the hospital. Kai said it was unusual for his mother to go away without telling anyone except Gregory. Police promised to investigate. They began by contacting the airlines. Records confirmed that a one-way ticket had been purchased for LL2 on July 13th. The destination was San Francisco via a connecting flight in Los Angeles. The ticket to Los Angeles had been used, but not the one for San Francisco. It appeared Lisa, too, wasn't planning to come back. This is the one from that was her right, the but the detectives that. needed to make one more call. They contacted the friend Lisa was supposed to be visiting in San Francisco. She said she hadn't been in the hospital, wasn't expecting Lisa, and hadn't yeah. talked to her in months. Now, detectives began to consider whether Lisa, too, intended to disappear, or if there might be a more sinister explanation. Detective Roger Thompson worked the case. It was not the normal missing person case where we, we know somebody's missing for a particular reason. They may not contact family members, but we sooner or later find them. This had some, um, some mystery to it. To find out more, detectives spoke to several of Lisa's friends and learned the twos had been married nearly 10 years. It was the second marriage for both, and Kai Lau was Lisa's son from her previous marriage. The twos had enjoyed the good life. Gregory was a successful restaurateur. In fact, one of his restaurants had been a favorite of Washington's elite. But it hadn't lasted. He'd suffered business reversals and lost his restaurants. A commissioned sales job couldn't support the family's affluent lifestyle. Gregory and Lisa argued about money, and their marriage was rocky. 
Police also learned that Lisa was romantically involved with another man. Police questioned him at his office. He said he spoke to Lisa the afternoon of July 14th, the last day anyone saw or heard from her. He denied knowing anything about a trip to San Francisco and expressed concern over Lisa's sudden disappearance. He indicated Lisa's husband was suspicious about their relationship. When he passed a polygraph test, investigators believed he was telling the truth. Detectives checked out the family's finances and saw indications of serious problems. Gregory was $30,000 in debt. Detective Mike Turner realized two was under a lot of pressure. Gregory was uh, known to like to gamble. And we determined that he, through interviews with friends, had accrued some debt in gambling that he had not been able to pay. And this was another problem that uh, arose uh, with his relationship with Lisa. Detectives also learned Lisa Tu's bank and charge accounts had been inactive since early July. That didn't make sense if she was alive. They discovered that her husband, who was still unreachable on a business trip, would collect a $200,000 life insurance policy if anything happened to his wife. Detectives began to suspect that the couple's financial woes might spell more than a simple missing persons case. As the investigation continued, Lisa's son was doing a little detective work of his own. Kai Lau found his mother's address book in her bedroom. That was odd because she seldom went anywhere without it. He also noticed that furniture in the house was missing or rearranged. He called Detective Turner. Hi, Detective Turner. Kai returned to the police station and met with investigators. He had found that $44,000 had been withdrawn from a bank account Lisa kept for his education. And that wasn't all. Kai told police his stepfather's gun was missing and a sleep sofa had disappeared. He said his mother often slept on it when she and Gregory weren't getting along. Kai also informed detectives that his stepfather, Gregory, was due back from his business trip that evening. By now, investigators had a lot of questions for Gregory, too. They met him at the airport and brought him to the police station. He was concerned about his wife and was eager to help police. He told them he bought Lisa a plane ticket to San Francisco so she could visit a friend in the hospital. He said he drove her to Dulles International Airport the next day and watched her board the plane. You wouldn't lie to us, would you, Mr. Two? Absolutely not. He claimed she called from Los Angeles and said she was awaiting the flight to San Francisco. He hadn't heard from her since. When they told him Lisa's friend wasn't sick and wasn't expecting her, he seemed surprised. Then he offered another explanation. He claimed his wife was unhappy with her appearance and wanted plastic surgery. He said they'd argued about it in the past. He surmised that might have been the real reason for the trip. Lisa probably made up the story of a sick friend, realizing he wouldn't buy the ticket if he'd known the truth. When detectives inquired about the missing sofa, Two said it was infested with mice, and he had it hauled away. He also said he threw the gun away after a well-publicized local incident where a homeowner shot some trespassers. He explained away the $30,000 debt as business and travel expenses. Two begged off further questions, saying he was tired from his long trip. Detectives agreed to continue the interview another day if two would take a polygraph test. He agreed and promised to return the following Monday. 
Gregory too didn't keep his appointment. He skipped town. To detectives, that seemed the act of a guilty man. We then felt that the suspicions that the family had, that we had put together uh, since the initiation of the investigation, now had come to fruition and we were looking probably at a homicide. Their suspicions about Gregory II grew even more when Kai brought them an Air Express letter from California. In it, Gregory claimed he was in Los Angeles looking for Lisa. If he didn't find her there, he planned to continue his search in San Francisco. Investigators considered the letter a self-serving excuse from a guilty man. But believing and proving are two different things. Without Lisa's body, there was no evidence she was dead. They began looking for proof in Gregory's story. Investigators followed up on Kai's tip about his missing college money and enlisted the help of the state's attorney's office. John McCarthy, deputy state attorney in Montgomery County, found Lisa had controlled it. Gregory too cleaned out that account. We got bank photographs from the bank and you clear as day you could see Gregory too stealing the $44,000 from that fund. And within a period of 10 days after he stole it, he had run through that money. It was gone. Detective Turner re-examined the airline ticket to San Francisco. They learned it was possible for someone to check in, have the ticket marked, but not board the plane. He suspected Gregory too had done that and that Lisa never boarded the plane. They contacted passengers who'd been on the flight. Then, attorney McCarthy got a real break. A woman called to say she'd been on the plane with her husband and small child. While airborne, the couple took several photographs. She says, well, I've got some pictures of the seat that Lisa too was supposed to be in on that plane from uh, Washington to uh, San Francisco, and uh, she's not in those pictures. And she forwarded to me those pictures, and uh, one of the ways we were able to prove conclusively that Lisa was not on that plane that Gregory said she was on was with the, those pictures. Detectives wanted to know more about the missing sofa sleeper. They wondered if Lisa's body was inside it when it was hauled away. They tracked down the men who picked it up. They remembered the couch because Gregory tipped them for carrying it out to the truck. They didn't notice anything unusual about it. Investigators traced it to the landfill, but that was a dead end. The sofa had already been ground up and buried. Detectives reasoned that Gregory might have gotten rid of the sofa because it contained proof of Lisa's death. If that were true, there could be other evidence at the residence. They obtained a search warrant to find out. An examination of Gregory's car uncovered incriminating evidence. Clumps of mud, weeds, and twigs were stuck in the undercarriage, indicating the car had been driven off-road. In the trunk, they found a plastic tarp, a carving knife, and a machete. Mike, come over here. Look. All of the items were clean, but they could have been used to dispose of a body. Inside the house, detectives found their first physical evidence of foul play. There were droplets of blood on a chair near the spot where the sofa had stood. But investigators suspected more might have been cleaned up. To find out, they processed the area with a luma light, which makes blood that cannot be seen with the naked eye glow. They discovered blood spatters where the sofa had been, and it displayed a significant pattern. We know that the couch was open at the time when this all occurred because there was no blood swiping or markings underneath the couch. It was a fold away, opened up couch, and when they put out the processing, you could see, basically see the outline of the couch opened up as a bed. Investigators also found signs of smearing, 
evidence someone had tried to clean up the blood. While they were processing the scene, the phone rang. A car rental agency in Las Vegas was calling for Gregory II. Yes. The car he rented several days before was overdue. Okay. It was the break police were looking okay. for. Now they finally knew where two was, but they needed some help in capturing him. What I would like you to do is, if he calls in about the car in the next few days, or brings the car in, try to stall him, or if he calls in, tell him that you would like to replace the car with another car because this one needs reservice or whatever reason you can think of or it's going to be resold, but somehow get him to come to the rental office to get another car. Well, my name's Greg. The plan worked. On Saturday, September 10th, he arrived at the car rental office. Yes, your car is ready. It is? Police arrested him on a fugitive warrant, nearly a month after he disappeared. Detectives Turner and Thompson flew to Las Vegas, where they began retracing Two's activities since he fled Maryland. A matchbook in his hotel room led them to a Chinese restaurant. The manager recognized Two from a photograph. He told investigators he had applied for a job, saying his wife was dead and he wanted to start a new life. On the job application, he gave his name as Greg Sen. When the detectives returned home with two, they called in a document examiner at the Maryland State Police Crime Lab. They knew Gregory had used aliases. They wanted to confirm whether the handwriting on the job application and other items he wrote matched the bank slip closing Kai Lau's college account. The stolen money would provide the motive for the more serious crime of suspected homicide. After providing known samples of Tu's writing, detectives awaited the results of the document examination. The job application, bank slip, and other documents were compared against Tu's handwriting. In making the comparison, factors such as writing style, speed, and pressure are all studied. Document examiner David Sexton explains. And it's a combination of those characteristics as well as a combination of recognizable letter formations and that combination of characteristics that are uh, unique to, to the individual's handwriting. The writing on the job application, bank slip, and other documents was Gregory II's. Hi, how are you? Police also consulted a forensic serology investigator about the blood spatters found at the two house. He confirmed they were consistent with a high velocity wound, most likely from a gunshot. Despite all the evidence investigators had collected, their case was still flawed. They needed something solid to prove murder. Without Lisa's body, the only physical evidence they had was blood from the house. In a divorce settlement, they, they had to somehow tie it to the victim. Kathy, Karen, and Linda, and they, all, they, all they had only one chance, and it was a long shot. To prove Lisa too had been murdered, Maryland investigators had to link her to the blood in the house. They hoped forensic DNA analysis could do that, but in 1988, it was still in its infancy. In fact, DNA evidence had only been used in a few trials nationally, none of them murder cases. And the two case posed a significant challenge. There were no known samples of Lisa Tu's DNA that could be used for comparison. Without them, it would be difficult to connect Lisa with the blood spatter. The DNA lab needed to perform a reverse paternity test, but this time they would have to work backward. They would determine Lisa's DNA from the blood of her son. Because Kai Lao was a genetic combination of both his parents, scientists could, in theory, 
forensically subtract his father's DNA from his blood. What remained would be Lisa's DNA profile. Blood was drawn from Kai Lao and from his father in Hong Kong for comparison. By process of elimination, the lab confirmed with 98 to 99 percent accuracy that blood found at the two house was Lisa. With forensic DNA testing, detectives were able to prove homicide. Investigators believe Gregory too was moved to murder by jealousy over his wife's affair and the prospect of solving his financial problems with her life insurance. They pieced together a likely scenario for the night of July 14th. There were indications that the couple had argued, perhaps over the affair, perhaps about money. Desperate and enraged, Gregory too pulled his gun from the cabinet and shot Lisa. He then disposed of her body. Despite his protestations of innocence, Gregory too was convicted of first degree murder on November 21st, 1989. He is currently serving a life sentence. Lisa Tu's body has never been found. Once, police had no chance of proving murder without a body. But today, they can make a case on forensic science, even when the victim has disappeared without a trace. Nevada, two unidentified women are found dead. Can tiny fibers tie them to their killer? A skeleton, a shopping bag, and a single button are investigators' only clues to the identity of a woman and her killer. A sailor is killed on a Florida beach. Only a tire track in the sand marks the path to justice. The clues to murder often elude the naked eye. But no killer can escape the telltale traces of guilt. Reno, Nevada is known as a betting town. In February of 1995, someone gambled he could kill without a trace. A transient man was searching a dumpster for things he could sell. When he made a gruesome discovery, Officers from the Reno police arrived and retrieved the body of an unidentified woman. It was almost completely camouflaged among the debris. For police, the myth of the perfect murder was dispelled long ago. Today, forensic science can win convictions from the most minute clues. But in this case, the killer seemed almost to be playing the odds. He could have disposed of the body in the desert, where no one would ever find it. 
Instead, he crafted an elaborate parcel, conspicuous because of its size, and hoped the dumpster would be empty before it was found. The complexity of the shroud was disturbing. The victim had been slipped into several large plastic garbage bags, which had then been carefully sewn inside a sleeping bag. The bundle was then wrapped in yellow plastic and tied with rope. The initial examination of the remains was made by the lead investigator, Detective David Jenkins. That degree of packaging was unusual because of its complexity and immediately suggested that uh, there had been a lot of preparation uh, and a lot of time involved in the packaging of the body. And that's uncommon in most body disposals. Right away, this elaborate wrapping gave police several important clues. The killer needed time to encase the victim like a modern mummy. And he needed a very private laboratory where he could do his grim work. To identify the body, detectives reviewed recent missing person reports. One case stood out. With family photographs and fingerprints, police confirmed that the victim was Catherine Powell. She had disappeared the Friday before the body was discovered. Her disappearance was first reported that next Monday, two days later, when she failed to show up to work. Miss Powell was an elementary school teacher, a very popular teacher. Uh, she was loved by her students and the other staff. And so immediately when she was reported as missing, there was a sense of urgency, uh, both by her staff and by her family, who felt that her disappearance was far more sinister than just her uh, not wanting to arrive at work. At her home, police saw no signs of forced entry or violence. But when her family looked over the apartment, they noticed several items missing, including a laptop computer and printer, a camera, and her purse. While detectives combed her apartment, forensics investigators pored over the evidence from the dumpster. If the wrappings held a clue to the killer's identity, investigators couldn't find it. They had never seen a case like this before, and the killer's attention to detail made them nervous. Investigators focused on the remains. The ropes and wrappings were preserved for later analysis. Police were not even sure how the victim had died. There was no indication of fatal trauma on the body. Forensic science would have to tell the story. And for an expert eye, there were many trace clues to read. The Washoe County Sheriff's Forensics Lab assigned the case to investigator Rich Berger. I don't really recall having attended an autopsy where there was such a profusion of uh, trace evidence potential on a person's body. There was apparent a number of blue-green strings and tufts of uh, material located basically from head to toe. Besides the fibers, Berger found a single metal shaving tangled in the victim's hair. None of these traces matched the fibers or samples gathered at the victim's apartment. Police suspected they were linked to the killer. The victim's body also bore telltale bruises. It appeared that she had been bound, gagged, and possibly tortured. The injuries suggested the killer was male. But new information suggested he hadn't worked alone. While forensic pathologists continued to gather the minute physical evidence, Detective Jenkins studied Powell's credit card records. Any recent charges might shed light on where she had been. He saw that her card was used to buy a $2,000 stereo on February 5th, the same day she disappeared. 
exotic looking or yeah. wide she, she, she was kind of exotic. The clerk said he'd chatted with the woman who bought the stereo. She had claimed to be Powell. So they identified themselves as Miss Powell. They were making a purchase to give to their daughter during a wedding. We were aware, having spoken with Miss Powell's family, that Miss Powell had no children. The clerk told police this woman did not fit the victim's description. He also recalled a crucial detail. The kind of truck the woman drove. Detectives traced it to its owner, a cable television installer named David Middleton. That break allowed us to focus our investigative efforts specifically on an individual rather than just the overall circumstances involving uh, her disappearance and the use of her credit cards. Police interviewed David Middleton about Catherine Powell. Though he had recently installed cable service in her home, he said they had talked only briefly. He claimed ignorance about her disappearance and murder. He knew nothing about her credit cards. But a background check revealed that Middleton was a convicted felon and a former police officer. While on duty in Miami, Middleton had lured a young woman into his patrol car, drove her to a secluded place, and sexually assaulted her. Stripped of his badge, Middleton served three years in prison. Upon release, he moved to Colorado and then to Nevada. Middleton's girlfriend was charged with fraud for using Catherine Powell's credit card. But because Middleton's truck was used in the crime, police now had grounds to search his home. We found a firearm, a shotgun. Uh, Mr. Middleton in the state of Nevada, because he is a convicted felon, was prohibited by law from possessing that weapon. Possession of the shotgun was a felony. But while it was cause for Middleton's arrest, it did not implicate him in Powell's murder. Police found no fiber evidence at his home to link him to the crime. Middleton was interrogated again. This time he changed his story. Now he admitted to beginning a sexual relationship with Catherine Powell. He said that he had been with her one night, then left for an hour. When he returned, she was dead. He refused to offer any more information. Middleton was now a prime suspect in Catherine's murder. But investigators had not a scrap of real evidence to link him to the crime. At the Washoe County Forensic Science Lab in Reno, the fibers found clinging to Catherine Powell's body were leading investigators nowhere. Desperate for clues, they re-examined the bruises on the victim's body. Right away, they focused on one in particular. It had an unusual crescent shape. Suspecting it was a bite mark, Detective Jenkins sought the help of forensic odontologist Raymond Rawson. Well, I saw just a few pictures of a, uh, a body that had been autopsied, and uh, there was a bruise on the, the left chest area, just uh, almost to the armpit. It was a bruise that stood out from anything else on the body, so it, uh, and it had the characteristics of a bite mark. Hoping this mark would lead them to the suspect, X-rays and plaster impressions were taken of Middleton's teeth and sent to Dr. Rawson. He wondered how hard a person would need to bite in order to leave a bruise like the one found on the victim. And if you see that, it leaves an indentation. Now, there's no bruising. And we found that you, uh, you have to actually bite so hard that you can't stand it to, pr to create a bruise. So when we see a bruise on the skin, we know that there were at least 200 pounds pressure and that that wasn't a willing situation. Somebody uh, would cry out in pain. Next, 
Dr. Rawson compared Middleton's bite pattern with the bruise on the victim's body. He placed the x-ray of the biting edges over a photograph of the bite mark. The details of the x-ray matched the bruise. We had one tooth that had a, uh, a wear pattern on it and that wear pattern was shown in the, in the bruise. So it was a very good match. The bite mark confirmed that Middleton was with Powell near the time of her death. A bruise this severe was no playful love bite. But neither was it evidence of murder. Police needed more concrete evidence. As news of the case spread, an anonymous informant called the police with a potential clue. Middleton had rented a large storage unit in nearby Sparks, Nevada. A search warrant was immediately served there. That information was significant because for the first time we were able to uh, locate a specific location where the kinds of activities involving the packaging of the body and the keeping of the body could have occurred. A storage unit would make a perfect workshop for a killer. Even before detectives entered the shed, they were suspicious of the amount of recent activity there. The entry records, obtained by Deputy District Attorney Tom Deloria, showed how often Middleton visited the unit. Well, we know from the gate entries, which was computerized uh, at the storage facility, that uh, Dave Middleton made numerous entries into that storage unit the Friday evening that uh, Kathy Powell was abducted from her residence, Saturday, again Sunday, again Monday, again uh, last entry being Tuesday morning. Were police walking into a glorified closet or a killer's lair? They knew their case against Middleton hinged on what they found here. At first, the shed was unremarkable, crammed with personal property. And anywhere else, the duct tape and coils of rope would have seemed harmless. When they found the stereo receiver that was purchased with the victim's credit card, they knew they were on to something. Then they found the items missing from the victim's home. But police already knew Middleton had been to her apartment. Evidence of burglary does not blouse, prove murder. And, uh, the handcuffs were perhaps a souvenir of Middleton's police days. But the scraps of women's underwear and a stun gun were not so easy to explain away. Especially in light of what they found next. Uh, find another a refrigerator lay on its back. The freezer's bottom had been cut away and small jagged air holes had been drilled into the sides. It had been modified apparently to hold a human body. Above the refrigerator dangled a system of ropes and pulleys strong enough to hoist a human being. The detectives could only begin to imagine what perversions were acted out here. This was a torture chamber, simply put. Um, the refrigerator, having been placed on its back, almost suggested a, a coffin. But did Middleton's depravity go as far as murder? Investigators still had to link him to the victim. In the refrigerator, they saw small blue-green fibers and human hair. As clues, they provided a glimmer of hope in a room full of horror. 
the refrigerator was brought back to the crime lab, where Rich Berger analyzed the fibers. To him, the threads in the refrigerator appeared to match those found on Powell's body, and genetic markers from the hair were consistent with the victims. The fibers from Powell's body were 100% cotton of a blue-green color, and that similarly those from the refrigerator were uh, composed of 100% cotton and the same color and that also the metal fragment from Catherine Powell's hair matched the metal and paint that went into the makeup of the freezer compartment of the refrigerator. The metal shaving found in the victim's hair matched the metal from the crude air holes. Investigators found the link they were looking for. The trace evidence proved that the victim was in David Middleton's storage unit. Detectives now formed a theory of how she died. The air holes were simply inadequate to keep her alive. She had suffocated. While investigators were grappling with the monstrous acts of David Middleton, they learned that Powell may not have been his only victim. On April 9th, a man was walking his dog outside Bernie, Nevada. He found the skeletonized remains of a human being. They were entangled in knotted ropes and plastic garbage bags. Police brought the remains to the crime lab. Criminalists compared its DNA to a sample from an unsolved missing persons case they made a positive match. A check of dental records confirmed the victim's ID. She was Thelma de Villa, who worked at one of the larger casinos in the area. She had been missing since August 8, 1994, the exact day Middleton had rented the storage shed. The excessive ropes, knots, and garbage bags found on de Villa's remains mirrored those found on Catherine Powell's body. The knots provided information about the victim's final hours. The stresses applied to the knots showed that both women were alive when their hands and feet were bound. And they had struggled desperately against the ropes before they died. We specifically looked at knots from two different murders and compared them to each other showing that the same types of knots had been used in both these uh, deaths. Devia's DNA was then compared to the DNA traces found in Middleton's shed. The results were ironclad. Like Powell, she had been in the shed. But the DNA traces of several other people were also found there. If David Middleton was a serial killer, Powell and Devia were the only victims ever found. As the case against Middleton was prepared, the grim sequence of events leading to Powell's death became clear. Middleton, working as a cable TV installer, had probably gained access to her home under the pretext of checking her cable service. He then subdued her and took her to his storage shed. There, she was tied up, brutalized, and kept confined in the airless refrigerator. Sometime during this torture, she died. Middleton methodically wrapped her body in plastic garbage bags, sewed it into a sleeping bag, and enshrouded the bundle with yellow plastic bound with rope. Finally, under cover of night, he disposed of the remains in the dumpster. Police were fortunate the body was ever found. 
But Middleton didn't realize that a brimming dumpster would appeal not only to him, but also to a transient looking for scraps. He had been clever up to a point. The investigation uncovered the fact that Middleton had installed cable service in an apartment near Thelma DeVia's home the week before she disappeared. And on the day of DeVia's disappearance, a neighbor remembered seeing Middleton near her home. On September 15, 1997, the jury convicted David Middleton of two counts of first-degree murder. Without uh, the DNA evidence, uh, without the trace and fiber evidence, without the metal uh, evidence and experts, and more, most importantly, uh, the testimony of our pathologist, uh, we would have had no case. Without the trace evidence, uh, we had nothing. This evidence was so compelling that Middleton was condemned to two sentences of death by lethal injection. Dave Middleton is not your typical killer. All I can say about uh, uh, this guy as opposed to most of them is certainly he's police smart and he's street smart. Uh, and when you have that, that's a dangerous combination. Whether murder is committed in an urban jungle or far out in the countryside, some trace of the deed will be left to tell the tale. March 22nd, 1988. Deep in a forest south of St. Louis, there began one of the most baffling cases ever encountered by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. And try to determine whether it's an Indian grave or it's a fresh grave, or it appears it's been here for some time. The case concerned fragments of a human skeleton. Was this an innocent, ancient death, or the victim of some monstrous modern crime? It would take some of the most specialized skills in forensic science to decide. Sergeants Don Bazelli, William Conway, and D.W. Kreitz were among the first on the scene. I received a phone call from the ranger at the Boy Scout camp who advised me that he had discovered some skeletal remains. Uh, I went to the scout camp and he directed me to the graveside. The investigation had its origins four months earlier. Ramo Pitkanen, a surveyor from Finland and former Eagle Scout, had been hired to make a map of the SF Boy Scout Ranch. On November 2nd, 1987, he made an unwelcome discovery. Frightened of becoming involved, Pitcannon told no one what he found until just before his return to Finland. Well, Interpol uh, had the Finnish authorities contact the gentleman in, in Helsinki and conducted an interview with him, which was sent to us in Finnish, uh, after which we had to have translated. For nearly a week, investigators combed the site. Pickings were thin, a skull and lower jaw, a few strands of dark hair, and an assortment of bones, some scattered several hundred feet from the grave. Many showed tooth marks, signs they had been chewed by animals. It's a very shallow grave. Uh, the bones, uh, doesn't look like we're gonna have many bones in it. Uh, we're finding on the outer perimeter uh, a couple of bones that may uh, belong to uh, what we've got here. We're gonna have to look into it. It's not much to go on right now. But as the investigation continued, clues slowly began to emerge, including a plastic shopping bag. We first thought that they could have been an Indian burial uh, site, but then when we excavated the grave, finding the service merchandise bag and determining that it was probably from 1979 to 1985, finding that down in the grave really helped us. There was another clue, one which would eventually narrow down the identity of the victim, a single metal button. Stamped across its face was a logo, Texwood. The next few weeks were frustrating for Conway and his colleagues. Preliminary investigations suggested the remains came from a young woman, perhaps 25 to 30 years of age, 
the mother of two or more children. Surely someone had reported her missing. Well, the, the victim was uh, first identified as a Caucasian female, and uh, we started checking uh, missing person reports on Caucasian females, and there were quite a few that fit the, uh, the approximate age and, and uh, size and weight of uh, what we had. In fact, this victim should have been especially easy to identify. She had perfect teeth. The skull and the remaining teeth indicated no dental work and no cavities, uh, which is very rare in our society, and, and we were able to eliminate a number of the suspected missing persons that we were investigating. Soon, the investigators had eliminated all the missing persons from Missouri and from a half dozen surrounding states. The skeleton in the woods was not a missing person, or rather, no one had reported this young woman as missing. The investigators decided to try another approach. They contacted forensic anthropologist Michael Charney at Colorado State University. He had a remarkable talent for identifying individuals from the most fragmentary skeletons. With near miraculous skill, he could often reconstruct the age, sex, and race, even the facial appearance of a missing person. I said, wait a minute, the first thing that hit me is that this was not a white person, this, is, this was Oriental. This was somebody of Mongoloid extraction, American Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Eskimo, something of that nature. Charney had picked up on something the police investigators missed. White people and black people have relatively long, narrow faces. People of Mongolian and Asian heritage have much broader faces. Meanwhile, police investigators were making progress of their own with other physical evidence from the grave. Their attention centered on that button with the curious Texwood logo. We thought when we found the button, it would be an easy thing to identify. Uh, the word Tex would being on the button, we called Texas, uh, trying to th find someone down there that might know it. We found all kind of manufacturers with the name Tex and Tex Wood uh, in Texas, but nothing would match. Finally, we called uh, U.S. Customs uh, within a couple hours. Uh, got a call back uh, to contact an agent in New York who put me in touch with a representative of Texwood. Who they manufacture the jeans, the blue jeans, uh, in Hong Kong. And they're called uh, the Levi of the Orient. Texwood sold jeans exclusively in the Far East, slender cuts specifically designed for Asian figures. The police's portrait of the victim was growing clearer. More important, it matched the picture given by Michael Charney, a slim woman, Asian, in her mid or late 20s, a mother of two or more children. The likelihood of the victim being from Asia dramatically narrowed the field of possible victims. But who was she? One of the many leads police pursued involved a missing person in Georgia, an Asian female. Officers investigating the case obtained a photo of the woman, which they sent to Charney. Michael Charney's approach was simple in theory, but tricky in practice. Take a photograph of the skull and superimpose it over the image of the possible victim. The fit must be exact if an identification is to be made. Would Charney and his colleague Nita Bittner be able to match the police photographs to the skull found in the woods at the Boy Scout camp? In this case, when we got the eyes and the nose in close proximity, the nose still doesn't match, it's too broad, the cheek depth is too far apart or not far enough on one side, the teeth are a mismatch, and the chin is still out of place. After trying and refocusing for size and other distortions, we were still unable to come up with a match. By now, every attempt to identify the victim had failed. Charney had one last suggestion recreate the woman's face. The reconstruction of a face from a skull is among the most specialized and most spectacular skills in a forensic anthropologist's arsenal. It begins with mathematical precision. 
a collection of round rubber pegs of varying lengths glued to a plaster cast of the skull. And there's another one that goes right in the here. pegs are landmarks, each identifying the thickness of soft tissue at particular points on the face. Next, the pegs are connected with strips of modeling clay. Bit by bit, humanity returns. Plastic eyes are placed in the sockets, and the skull comes to life. Careful modeling, perhaps dabbing with a damp sponge, gives the texture of skin. Paint, a black wig, will complete the transformation. For the first time, we can glimpse the victim face to face. In doing a facial reconstruction, um, it's not as important that it's absolutely accurate, but that it gives a glimpse of who the person was to somebody out there who will hopefully recognize it. When we do our facial reconstructions, it's generally a last ditch attempt. Now, would anyone recognize the face rebuilt by Michael Charney's team? August 24th, a photograph of the reconstructed face appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Three days later, two informants claimed that the photo looked like their friend, Bunchi Nyhaus. A mother of two, she was a native of Thailand. They had not seen her since late 1983. Bunchi had a husband, Richard Nyhaus, an ex-GI whom she had met in Bangkok during the Vietnam War. When we first talked to Mr. Niehaus, he appeared to be uh, an upstanding citizen. He, uh, he maintained a, a nice house by himself, uh, clean, very, you know, upstanding citizen in a nice neighborhood. He was uh, employed, gainfully employed, full time. He was raising two sons on his own. Uh, they attended church, were very good students. Nyhaus had a ready explanation for his wife's absence. In December 1983, he and Bun Chi had a series of bitter arguments. She had insisted on leaving him and their two sons and returning to Bangkok. It was a story the officers didn't entirely believe. The way to resolve the matter was to eliminate Bun Chi as the victim in the forest grave. He was very cooperative. He provided me photos out of their photo album uh, of his wife that we could use if we needed to in the investigation. The photograph was not ideal, but Michael Charney did his best. Like any photograph at an angle would be, you have to get it in the same two planes exactly, you see. Despite the difficulties of matching the position of face and skull, in the end, Michael Charney had no doubt that this was Bun Chi. We first received a word from our lab that Dr. Charney had matched uh, the photographs of Bun Chi Nyhaus to the remains that, that we had recovered. And at that time, the case took on a whole new outlook. We now knew who our victim was, and we also had a good uh, suspect to start with in, in Mr. Nyhaus. The investigators quickly uncovered a series of incriminating facts. Richard Nyhaus and his wife frequently had noisy arguments. He had taken several days off work in December 1983, the same time his wife disappeared. Soon after she vanished, Nyhaus divorced Bun Chi and removed her as a beneficiary of his insurance. And then one final damning discovery. We ultimately discovered that he was a Boy Scout leader, which then tied right into the fact that her remains were found in a Boy Scout camp. He had been actively involved with Boy Scouts with his children for many years. By now, Richard Nyhaus was the primary suspect. The investigators decided to invite him in for further questioning. They chose their moment with care. A weekend when Nyhaus was camping at the SF Ranch, not far from where his wife's body had been hidden. The officers informed Nyhaus the remains they had recovered had been identified as those of his wife. Nyhaus admitted he had pushed his wife, who had fallen and hurt her head. When she threatened to call the police, to leave him, taking the children with her, he bent down, put his hand over her nose and mouth, 
and held it there until she was dead. Then he hid her body in the freezer. The reason that we weren't getting any hits out of the uh, computer files is that the victim's husband didn't ne never reported her missing. He said that he took her to the airport and she went back to Thailand, but in fact he murdered her. Kept her in his house, in the freezer, for three months, and then took her down to the Boy Scout ranch and buried her. Richard Nyhaus was convicted of first degree murder. He is now serving a life sentence without parole. Time and the elements had taken their toll on Bun Chi's body, adding to the difficulty of finding her killer. But even just a few hours can make the difference between solving a case and losing the trail forever. In September 1983, two friends near Jacksonville, Florida were shocked to find the body of a man. He lay on his side at the foot of a sand dune. His head showed severe wounds. Investigators from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office quickly responded. They found no identification on the body. The only clues were a broken pool cue and footprints leading to some tire tracks in the sand. Police worked carefully to gather and protect all the evidence. The tire track seemed like the most promising clue to lead to the killer. They were lucky to have it. Rain, the slightest breeze, or one false step could destroy the fragile traces. Preserving the tire tracks required particular expertise. The very act of making a cast could destroy them. Police called the Jacksonville Regional Crime Laboratory and forensic criminalist Ernest Ham. So the crime scene was processed with these tracks in mind. Uh, the footwear tracks and the tire tracks were photographed. Then we want to make a plaster cast because a plaster cast will give us a true representation, a three-dimensional representation of the object that made it. Care in the pouring was crucial in order to prevent the weight of the plaster from destroying the print. If the evidence were altered, a killer might go free. After the plaster had set, the cast was carefully cleaned. Now, police had a perfect three-dimensional reproduction of the tire tread. It included the gouges and signs of wear that made that tire unique. But millions of tires roll on America's highways today. It seemed impossible for investigators to find the one tire that had made these tracks. They studied the plaster cast, noting the ribs and grooves of the tread design. Despite the odds of finding the tire, it offered investigators their best chance to catch the killer. Matching the track with a tire on a suspect's car would be as conclusive in court as a fingerprint. Ham searched through thousands of photographs in the pages of the Tread Design Guide to find the one tire he needed. As Ham searched for a clue to the killer, another jogger found a clue to the victim. The wallet belonged to a 21-year-old sailor serving on a ship docked at the Mayport Naval Air Station in Jacksonville. An officer from the ship was called to the morgue. He confirmed that the victim was Jeffrey Michael Russell. An autopsy was performed on the victim's remains. He had been beaten, probably with the pool cue found at the scene. It bore no usable fingerprints. 
He had then been shot once in the head from less than two feet away. The pathologist recovered a 357 caliber bullet from the victim's brain. Russell's shipmate said he was well liked and had been out with friends on the night he died. Thanks for coming, guys. Police speculated that the victim might have even shared a round of drinks with his killers. He was last seen leaving a party, planning to hitchhike back to base. While the police traced the victim's movements, Ham continued his arduous, time-intensive search of the tread guide. Finally, after reviewing thousands of images, he found the single tire that matched the cast. The track at the beach was made by a tire commonly mounted on pickup trucks. Now, police knew what they were looking for, though it hardly seemed to advance their investigation. To find one truck out of thousands in the Jacksonville area would be daunting. But then police got a lucky break that saved them hundreds of hours. An officer, answering a call about a robbery, pulled over a suspicious truck. The driver tried to run off, but was soon apprehended and arrested. His name was Gregory Kokel. Police inspected his truck. They found a gun under the seat. Kokel was known to police. He was a suspect in a murder case several years before, though never charged. But his name had come up even more recently. Police had just received an anonymous tip that Kokel had bragged of robbing and killing a man on the beach. The gun retrieved from the truck, a 357 revolver, was the same caliber used to kill Russell. The officer then noticed that the tires seemed to resemble the ones involved in Russell's murder. Until now, solving the case had seemed like a long shot. Now, police had the prime suspect and possibly all the evidence to convict him. To make the charges stick, they'd have to link him to the scene of the crime. Police looked to the tires to make that connection. An officer compared Kokel's right front truck tire to a photograph from the tread guide. The way he described it was that the hair stood up on the back of his neck that he was really seeing what we told him he was going to see. The tire was the brand and model they were looking for. But police were not certain it was the same tire that left its mark at the beach. Ham's work wasn't done. He still had to find the exact section of the tire's tread that had made the print. He scrutinized every inch of the tread, looking for cuts, gouges, and wear that matched the portion captured in plaster. These are the marks and gouges that are put into a tire as you drive it. These will leave what we need for making a positive identification. This makes this tire unique. But every mile driven since the night of the murder put new wear marks on the tire and altered the old ones. Even if Ham had the exact tire in his lab, it might be too late to make the perfect match. A killer could still go free. Jacksonville police were building a murder case on a foundation of sand. Now they needed harder evidence. After careful analysis, investigators found marks in Gregory Kokel's tire that matched the casting made at the crime scene. But police needed to prove that Kokel himself was there. I'll make the call later. They hoped Kokel's 357 would provide the smoking gun they needed. If this was the exact gun that fired the fatal bullet, 
Investigators had to prove that Coco pulled the trigger. Ham performed three tests designed to link the gun with the crime. Our first examination will be a visual examination because we want to see if there's any other sort of trace matter on the weapon before we subject it to some sort of processing techniques, such as uh, in this case because it's a head wound. If it was a close head wound, we could possibly have tissue blowback into the weapons. But this test was a dead end. No tissue or blood was found on the gun. The next step was to test it for fingerprints. The gun was sealed in a glass cabinet and exposed to fumes of cyanoacrylate ester, or common superglue. These fumes adhere to fingerprints, making them easier to see and compare. But based upon the individual characteristics of the ridges, the endings and the divisions and the dots, we can make a positive identification from any part of the body that bears friction skin. The fumes did their work in just a few minutes. The print on the gun was compared to Kokel's prints at his arrest. They were a perfect match. This one fingerprint only proved that Kokel had held the gun. It did not prove that this gun had fired the fatal bullet. That could only be determined by a ballistics test. The test fired bullet was placed side by side on a microscope for comparison with the bullet that killed the victim. The investigator lines up the rifling patterns on both bullets. A video monitor allows him to see the minute scratches on the soft lead. If the marks align, he has proof that the same gun fired both bullets. And that's precisely what he saw. The scratch marks on both slugs were identical. Investigators had found the murder weapon. As the prosecution prepared for trial, the events of Russell's final night came into focus. As he hitchhiked back to the base, he was picked up by Gregory Kokel and a friend. But instead of dropping Russell at his quarters, they drove him to the beach, beat him, robbed him of the only dollar he had, and then Kokel shot him. Crimes committed by strangers on strangers are the hardest to solve. But the scratches on the bullet, the fingerprint, and the tire tread bore the traces of the killer's guilt. Close forensic analysis pulled them together to make a solid case against Kokel. The weapon was the weapon that fired the fatal shot. The fingerprint belonged to the individual that was suspected of committing the crime. The senseless, random nature of the murder assured that Gregory Kokel and his accomplice would receive stiff sentences. Forensics proved beyond a doubt that Kokel fired the fatal bullet. He was sentenced to death. His friend was deemed an accessory to murder and received 14 years. For years, only the most obvious evidence could be used to solve a murder. Today, scrupulous collection methods by police and rigorous evidence processing by forensics experts are helping to assure that nothing gets overlooked.
America. Investigators find a clue they think will lead to a killer's front door, but instead find themselves heading down a blind alley. Now their most important evidence is withering before their eyes. When a man reports his wife missing, her abandoned car becomes the biggest clue, but it's the nosy neighbors who drive the investigation. Four months into her marriage, a woman disappears, but when her body turns up, it's clear she was no runaway bride. Investigators must rely on flimsy evidence to bag her killer. For some lovers, marriage can be murder. Even though proving it may pose a challenge, killers can't divorce themselves from the consequences of their broken vows. morning hours of December 28, 1995, Melinda and David McLean let themselves into the apartment of their sister-in-law, Becky Vargas. The telephone and electricity in her unit hadn't been switched on yet. Rebecca? Becky was separating from her husband and had just rented the Ogden, Utah apartment. Becky? She had told her husband, Stephen Vargas, that she was going to try to start organizing her belongings and would return in an hour or two. But that was several hours ago. Stephen had asked Melinda and David to check on her, since they lived nearby. Melinda, who was Stephen's sister and Becky's best friend, was glad to go. Though they didn't see Becky, all seemed quiet and safe. leaving them unprepared for what they found. Becky Vargas lay dead in the leaves outside the building. Even before the sun was up, the Weber County, Utah Crime Scene Investigation Unit began its day processing the murder scene. The victim's blouse had been pulled up. At first glance, the condition of her clothes made her appear to be the victim of a random sexual homicide. But a closer look revealed the story was not so simple. Criminalist Russ Dean thought the scene might have been staged. It was as if her body had been moved from one location to another. Uh, her arm was under her body as if she'd been dragged. Her coat was removed and was under her body. The leaves were bunched up in certain locations around her arms and legs. And there was no other obvious indication of any type of sexual assault. In fact, though the victim had suffered a head injury, most of the blood had pooled at her feet, suggesting she'd been turned around. Whoever did this had apparently tried to throw off the investigators. The forensics team documented and collected a set of car keys, a cigarette lighter, fragments of blood-spattered leaves, and most significantly, the apparent murder weapon, a broken flashlight stained with blood and entangled with hair. They spent six hours sifting through every inch of the area before they were satisfied. They determined that although the body had been repositioned, the victim hadn't been moved far. The only blood found was just a few inches from where she lay. Because the blood-stained flashlight was the most compelling clue, it was analyzed first at the Utah State Crime Lab in Salt Lake City. Yeah. 
Investigators could see that it had a partial fingerprint on it, stamped in blood. According to latent print examiner Scott Spute, a bloody fingerprint can be even better than a smoking gun. When we have a bloody fingerprint, for example, it's the victim's blood, it's not her finger, it's someone else's finger on the evidence. It's a crucial pinpointing item of evidence in which we can identify someone being at that crime scene, leaving that bloody fingerprint behind at the scene as they left. It would be bad practice to home in on that one print. The lab had to inspect the flashlight for additional prints. The obvious ones and the ones that remained invisible. It required two separate processes. Blood stains, because they're not oily, can flake or rub off. To fix them in place, the flashlight was heated to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. After I heat it on, I then put a, a stain on there, which is called amido black, which reacts to the blood and makes it very visible and oftentimes brings out areas of blood that were invisible prior to treatment. To develop the latent or unseen prints, the flashlight was exposed to super glue vapor. The adhesive bonds to the moisture on the print, creating a durable shell that exposes and preserves it. Then, a fluorescent dye is applied, which adheres to the super glue. The latent prints shine under ultraviolet light. Testing revealed no other blood-stained prints. The original one, along with the latent prints, would have to do. Once a suspect was isolated, investigators were confident that the bloody fingerprint was all they'd need. While the clues were being scrutinized, Melinda McLean and her husband David went to the police station to give their statements. Melinda told police that she'd been best friends with Becky Vargas for 14 years. Becky had been married to her brother, Stephen Vargas, for nine of them, but it looked like their marriage was coming to an end. As far as she knew, the split was amicable. Though Becky was having an affair that her husband Stephen Vargas may have suspected, there didn't seem to be a lot of tension between the couple. In fact, it was Stephen who had called the McLeans to look in on her after the police told him they had no officers available to check on his wife. David McLean, down the hall, told police a similar story. He said that Stephen Vargas had called him just before 11 p.m. the night before the murder. Uh, did Steve at all go over there? Stephen was worried because she was away so long. And the apartment had no lights. He said that he and Melinda stopped by. Though Becky's car was in the driveway, there was no answer. They went to a window to see if everything was okay, but stopped when they heard moaning. They thought that perhaps her boyfriend was there, so they left. They went to a payphone to tell Stephen that everything was fine. They told him what they had heard, then they left. David told police that out of curiosity, they drove back to Becky's a short time later. Now they were surprised to see Stephen Vargas's jeep parked out front. Soon he appeared from beside the building, got into the vehicle, and drove off. David said that they caught up with him. Stephen was wearing his bathrobe and slippers. He told them he wanted to check on Becky himself, but asked the McLeans not to tell anyone he was there. When David revealed this detail to the police, Melinda reluctantly admitted it was true. Hey, Ron, 
David told police that Stephen called them once more early the following morning. He said that Becky still wasn't home and asked them to check on her again. That's when they found her dead. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the lantern found at the scene wasn't the actual murder weapon, but it may have been used to subdue the victim. From the shape of the wound, she was apparently struck down with a hammer or something similar. No such object was located. The killer was clever enough to carry off or remove some of the most incriminating evidence. Authorities hoped he'd left enough behind. At the police station, investigators continued to talk with the McLeans. Their detailed story seemed to pivot on Stephen Vargas. Then it took a more provocative twist when the police dispatcher told Detective David Wheeloth that Vargas was on the phone, but he wasn't calling about his wife. She said that he was on the phone inquiring about his sister and his brother-in-law and if they were in fact at the police station. And I told the dispatcher, yeah, that's who we're, we're in here talking to. And if she would ask him if he would mind coming down to the police station as well. Separation. Police told him about um, Becky's murder and said that his in-laws were fine. Was aware of but he might not be because Melinda aware. and David She's saw him at the murder scene. Loved a lot. I, I, he admitted that he was there that night, just as the McLeans had said. He peeked in the window, but he heard and saw nothing. Because the window was right next to where the victim was found, Wheeloth didn't believe him. If Steve had gone there to look and listen, uh, I don't think it would have been likely that he would have not seen Becky lying just a few feet away. His suspicious behavior and the eyewitness testimony by the McLeans was enough to get a warrant to search Stephen Vargas's Jeep and to collect his fingerprints and the blood sample. Can you get a, uh, can you get a paper bag? Investigators were after anything that could link him to the crime scene. They found nothing but minuscule fragments of leaves and not even many of those. Actually, I wish I could find my little The Jeep looked the recently vacuumed. They collected what they could, then returned the vehicle to Vargas and sent him home. The forensics team I'm hoped they wouldn't need to rely on the leaves. Now that they had Vargas's fingerprint, they could compare it to the ones from the flashlight. Most of the prints did, in fact, match Stephen Vargas. But that made sense. He owned it. So the only one that really mattered was the one stamped in blood. The bloody fingerprint had a shape called a tented arch. Of the three features of fingerprints, loops, arches, and whorls, arches are the least common. And tented arches are rarer still. Only 5% of the population has them. Stephen Vargas was among that group. But the fingerprint on the flashlight wasn't clear enough to make a definitive comparison. Vargas might have left it, and then again, maybe not. I cannot say he did not leave that print behind. I can only say it's not enough to identify it positively. They thought the flashlight would illuminate the killer. Without it, their hopes of solving the case looked considerably more dim. Investigators working to solve the Becky Vargas homicide saw their most promising piece of evidence rendered useless. According to Detective Wheeloth, a case that had looked cut and dried now depended on very fragile clues. After we lost the flashlight, uh, about the last piece of, of physical evidence we had that we could try and do anything with were the leaf fragments that were recovered out of the Jeep. If investigators could find specks of blood on the tiny fragments, they would support the idea that Stephen Vargas was close enough to the body 
to attract them into his jeep. It fell to supervising criminalist Pilar Shortsleeve to analyze the minuscule samples. Trying to see blood on a small piece of colorful leaf was difficult. So we used a stereo zoom so we could get down and look very closely at the leaves and then um, to kind of guesstimate if we had any stains and then we would do some preliminary tests. Well, Out of the five so samples of leaves, enough? Pilar Shortsleeve found traces of blood on two but she had no proof the blood was the victim's. She rushed the samples to a DNA lab for analysis, fearing it might already be too late. Whenever um, blood or body fluids are left on soil or, or samples that contain a lot of possible bacteria, the bacteria begin immediately in destroying the sample. Um, they destroy not only the cells, but they get into the DNA and start to break the DNA down. It would take three months for the results to come back from the lab. Investigators had to bide their time, but they didn't do it idly. They had to assume that the results would be negative and began to build their case some other way. Police served a warrant to search Vargas's apartment. They were after the bathrobe and slippers he was seen wearing at the crime scene. If he had beaten his wife to death, surely they'd be blood spattered. Vargas left the clothes in plain sight, easy to find. What are you looking for, Detective? Murder. He was supposed to be wearing a bathrobe and a pair of slippers. The bathrobe had been freshly laundered. The slippers had no trace of debris on them. That in itself was strange, considering he admitted walking outdoors in them. It seemed like uh, Stephen Vargas was one step ahead of us on getting rid of any physical evidence that might link him to the crime scene. Uh, it seemed like every step that we thought of to locate that evidence was foiled. Robert? Yeah. But there was one clue he couldn't bury because it was 375 miles away in Cheyenne, Wyoming. After several weeks of wrestling with his conscience, Vargas's half-brother, Robert Esquivel, called police to tell of a favor that Stephen had asked before Becky's murder. Steve had asked him if he would come out here and kill Becky for him. Police set up a phone tap in Esquivel's apartment and had him call Vargas to get him to talk about their previous conversation. Steve had gone through this, this denying or not remembering that part of their conversation, that it had been a joke, and towards the end even got threatening. Though it stopped short of a confession, Vargas had said enough for police to arrest him on January 11, 1996, for the murder of Becky Vargas but they weren't sure they had enough evidence to convict him. One month later, the results of the DNA test on the blood spattered leaves found in Stephen Vargas's Jeep came through. A comparison of the DNA from the blood on the leaves matched Becky Vargas's DNA. The blood on the blood fragments matched Rebecca Vargas. Now yes. authorities were confident of a conviction. Where are you going? Based on the evidence, police put together a likely scenario. Stephen Vargas, angry with his wife for her infidelity and their upcoming divorce, confronted her at her new apartment. They fought. Don't you dare! It escalated. he hit her with the flashlight, knocking her out. He moved her to the side of the house, thinking she was dead. He was wrong. Did you hear that? He wanted someone else to find the body, so he asked the McLeans to check up on her. Can we go home they mistook her death throes for the throes of passion. When they told Stephen, he returned to finish what he'd begun, using a more lethal weapon. Tiny fragments of leaves told the whole story.
well in this case in particular we had this flashlight that had a possible fingerprint in it in blood and that would have been the piece of evidence that kind of closed all the loose ends but it didn't happen in this case it was a very small piece of leaf that was found in a vehicle that had blood on it that came from the victim and it was just the interesting and exciting part that something so small could be so integral in a case. Stephen Vargas was convicted of first-degree murder and is now serving 20 years to life. The case of Becky Vargas began with the discovery of her body. But when a person just disappears, it's not clear that a crime has even been committed. In this story, the names of the victim and the killer have been changed. On the morning of July 31st, 1987, Dan Remington of San Diego, California, was taking his kids to the YMCA. En route, he noticed his wife's abandoned car on the side of the road. Not wanting to alarm his children, he dropped them off at daycare, then rushed home to call the police. San Diego police dispatched an officer. On his way to Remington's house, he stopped to examine the vehicle. The car apparently had a flat tire. The doors were locked, and he could see no spare, nor any sign of 29-year-old Liz Remington. When the officer arrived at the Remington's home, Dan Remington told him that he last saw his wife at 10.30 the previous night when she left for work. After he saw her car at 7.30, he called the hospital where she was a maternity nurse, but she hadn't shown up. Remington admitted that their 12-year marriage was rocky. They were discussing divorce, but hadn't filed the papers yet. I called around and changed a couple of things. You have by chance have a key for the vehicle? Dan handed the officer a key to the car and granted permission to impound it in search of clues. While it was possible that Liz's disappearance could be logically explained, Missing persons cases fell under the domain of the homicide unit. They had the skills to collect and preserve every piece of potential evidence found at the scene. Check the spare yet? They found nothing obvious to indicate foul play and towed the car to the police garage. Any overlooked clues would be preserved in case the car required a closer look. Detectives visited a nearby convenience store, thinking that Liz might have gone there after her tire went flat. The clerk told them that she had been in the night before. She needed to break a $20 bill to make a phone call. He didn't know who she called. Police remembered that Dan Remington told them she hadn't called home. It seemed reasonable to believe she may have simply run off with someone else. Liz's sister told police that was inconceivable. She wasn't the kind of woman who would run from a failing marriage. No matter how bad things became, she'd never leave her children. Sergeant Dennis Brugos of the San Diego Metro Task Force found that was the consensus. She was very devoted to her children and her family. She helped at school, she helped at Little League, 
and uh, just not the type of woman that would ever walk away from her family. Liz's sister told police it was strange that the spare tire was missing. Dan had changed the oil two weeks earlier and made a point of thoroughly checking the car, including the spare. Investigators took statements from the Remington's neighbors. Many spoke of the deteriorating relationship between Liz and Dan. The information was duly noted, but in terms of evidence that any crime had been committed, investigators had absolutely nothing. At the time of Liz Remington's disappearance, San Diego police were grappling with an apparent serial killer. Because there was no evidence that Remington had left against her will, these more violent crimes took priority. There was no body, there was no weapon, and therefore she was simply one of many missing adults throughout this county. And at that particular time, there was actually a series uh, of sorts that was going on where there was upwards of 40 women who's, who were found murdered uh, in the East County area. So certainly that would have precedent over a missing person. Four years passed since Liz Remington's disappearance. Most of the murdered women were transients or prostitutes, so she was not considered one of the killer's victims. But when a task force was formed to look into the serial killings, her file came up too, and investigators realized she was still missing after all this time. The neighbors taped statements, and the detective reports were dusted off. Well before Liz's disappearance, they had kept a close eye on the Remingtons and helped Liz out whenever they could. Over time, friction between the couple increased and neighbors grew concerned about her and the children. One even kept a log of what went on at the house after Liz disappeared. To demonstrate how the Remingtons' relationship had deteriorated, a neighbor told investigators about how Dan tried to sell Liz's car without her permission. According to the neighbor, Liz wasn't just surprised, she was furious. A huge fight ensued. He said that the only reason Dan didn't sell the vehicle was because Liz had the only key and wouldn't give it to him. But police recalled that on the day Liz disappeared, Dan had the key to her vehicle in his possession. Police also learned that neighbors had reported seeing Dan Remington filling in a ravine at the back of his property with a bulldozer shortly after Liz's disappearance. They said that after her disappearance, they saw him visit that part of the property every few days. He never ventured back there before she disappeared. Remarkably, because the case had never been officially closed, Liz's car had remained impounded all this time. Dan had sued to get it released, but lost. Technically, it was still considered evidence. Now it would be looked at more thoroughly. One of the first things investigators found were coins in the ashtray. Purportedly, Liz had been last seen by a convenience store clerk when she wanted change to make a phone call. The clerk's statement suggested she was okay. Now, investigators weren't so certain, since she had ample change in her car. They contacted the clerk to interview him again. That clerk at the convenience store uh, actually said he wasn't real sure that it was her. So that helped us to establish the fact that we didn't really know for sure whether she was there. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused.
Rugos wondered if the flat tire could have been staged. He sent the flattened tire from Liz's car to Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron, Ohio. Their lab is designed to evaluate the causes of tire failure. Here. The tire was examined uh, on the rim. Report was the tire was flat, is still flat. There's definitely no air. Investigators found no outward signs of damage. Only a tiny puncture, which would have led to slow deflation. Once the leak was isolated, product analysis manager Chester Patterson took the tire off its mount and examined it more thoroughly. From the looks of it, the tire went flat after the car had stopped. We saw no damage on this tire. We saw no reason to have alerted any driver in the vehicle that something was going soft or or whether the tire was deflating. Because in order to do that, you, the tire is beginning to come apart. And you would see that damage on the tire itself. And we saw no such damage. But he did see something he'd never seen in his 35 years experience. The tire removed from Liz Remington's car had been punctured from the inside out. This tire has been punctured from the inside. See these two impressions, circular impressions, right under the punctures of the tire. And we noticed the rust that's contained in them. And it told me that somebody had taken a nail and pounded it through the inside of the tire to cause that circular nail head impressions on the liner itself. He concluded that the tire had definitely been tampered with. Four years after Liz Remington's disappearance, investigators had enough to get a warrant to search Dan Remington's house. They found nothing of significance inside. Outside, a different story. In the yard, a police backhoe went to work excavating the filled-in ravine. Uh, the backhoe was probably two or three hours into the job when it hooked onto a piece of chain link fence that was lying flat. Uh, the excavation slowed down. What we found underneath that chain link fence was a tire. The tire was the missing tire from Liz's car. And underneath that tire, wrapped in sheets and blankets, was the body of a female. And a missing persons investigation became a murder case. Dan Remington was arrested and taken away. Officially, the body was considered a Jane Doe until a positive ID could be made. A forensic anthropologist determined the remains were those of a Caucasian female who had died of blunt trauma to the head. She had been in her late 20s to early 30s, about the same height as Liz Remington. It seemed like they had found what they were looking for, but the law required more proof than that. Forensic dentist Norman Sperber was called in. Everything hinged on the teeth. Teeth are the most durable part of the body, and we fortunately had dental films from her dentist. We were able to take films of her teeth because they were in very good condition. By comparing the shape and position of the victim's fillings and teeth with Liz Remington's dental records, Sperber was able to make a positive ID. Liz Remington had been found. Because the victim was discovered wrapped in bed linens, investigators believed that Dan killed her while she was napping before work. Afterward, he carried the body out to the ravine, buried it in a shallow grave, then rented the earth-moving equipment a short time later, piling on 8 to 12 feet of dirt. 
Then he drove to the scene and replaced the good tire with the one he had flattened. Next morning, he reported his wife missing, confident the police would never piece it together. His unwitting accomplice was a suspected serial killer who demanded all of the police department's resources. But the clues eventually resurfaced, exposing the crime. Though Remington's exact motive will never be known, authorities believe he couldn't bear the shame of divorce or the fact that he'd lose half of his wealth and property. In October 1992, Dan Remington was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without parole. Remington went to a great deal of trouble to hide his crime. Others take an easier approach, which sometimes makes their crimes harder to solve. On September 21st, 1995, a body was discovered in a wooded area in Boise, Idaho. Plastic bags bound with duct tape encased the feet and head. From its state of decay, it had obviously been there several days. No ID was found. No attempt had been made to conceal the body. It appeared to have been hurriedly dumped there. Because of its position and wrappings, investigators couldn't even determine the victim's gender without disturbing an already disturbing scene. At this point, anything could be a clue so the body wasn't unwrapped or inspected until it got to the morgue, where it was scrutinized under controlled conditions. Okay. The tape was carefully cut away, and the bags removed and preserved. The victim was female, around 60 years old. The coroner determined that she was strangled, she was most likely killed elsewhere, wrapped up, and transported to the woods where she was found. She fit the description of Wanda Kuzmachev, reported missing six days earlier. Wanda had been reported missing by her second husband, Ben Kuzmachev, when she failed to return from work. The couple had been married just four months. Both had retired from the large firm they worked for. Wanda took a job cleaning offices. You are beautiful. Thank you. Ben, a Russian immigrant who had once been artistic director for the Idaho Ballet, now worked for a security company. After Ben reported her missing, detectives wondered if Wanda had had second thoughts about her second marriage and simply run off. But a check of her jewelry and possessions showed she'd taken nothing with her. That's never a good sign. And then her body turned up. The victim's car had not been found, so the bags she was wrapped in became the most important clue. Criminalist Cynthia Hill set to work examining them. It was all she had. Well, in this case, we didn't have a murder weapon. There were no eyewitnesses. And the place where Wanda was found was not the murder scene. So all these things were playing against us. Hill fumed the bags in superglue to bring out any fingerprints. The glue, contained in foil pouches, vaporizes and bonds to the print, preserving it. The print can then be dusted with powder to make it more visible. Then photographed to create a record. 
Hill found only one print on the bag around the victim's legs, but so far she had no one to compare it with. Ben Kuzmichev was called to the police station to provide a set of prints for comparison. In a murder investigation, it's standard procedure to get a spouse's prints. Have you ever been fingerprinted before? No, sir. Let me do all the work. Usually, it eliminates the spouse as a suspect. In this case, that isn't quite how it worked out. The print on the bag matched Ben's. That didn't necessarily mean he'd had a hand in his wife's murder. If the bag had been taken from the victim's own car, Ben might have handled it prior to its use in the crime. The print was lifted from a portion of the bag where one would normally grab it. In terms of evidence, it wasn't enough. These people are living together. They're touching objects that one another uh, touch. Um, you have to be able to find a fingerprint in a location where they wouldn't normally have touched, or it's in conjunction with another piece of evidence that puts them um, at the scene. Hill still believed that the bags might contain more prints. Though she didn't have the technology to lift them, she knew that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab did. If prints were there, the Mounties could find them, or so she hoped. She carefully packed her bags, sent them to Canada, and awaited the results. While Cynthia Hill waited for her prints to come from Canada, investigators in Idaho found Wanda Kuzmachev's car. More than a week had passed since her body was discovered. The vehicle had been abandoned in a store parking lot four miles from where she was found. Police processed the vehicle for fingerprints. They raised two prints from the trunk lid. Their placement suggested they were left by the person closing the trunk. Inside, investigators found something surprising. Nothing at all. For Detective David Smith of the Boise, Idaho Police Department, that was a significant discovery. In talking with the family members, they said that she would always carry her Jehovah Witness literature in the trunk. In fact, they said you could not put anything in her trunk because it was so full. But the trunk wasn't entirely empty. Investigators found a single drop of blood. It belonged to the victim. Whoever had put her in the trunk had also left fingerprints on the gear shift knob. Prints on the trunk and on the gear shift matched Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators faced the same challenges as before. The car belonged to Ben's wife. It stood to reason that he could leave his fingerprints on it. Still, it seemed strange that his were the only clear prints found, especially since he told police that as far as he knew, Wanda was the last person to drive the vehicle. The evidence suggested that Ben drove it last, leaving behind the clearest prints. Tests were conducted to show that in approximately 70% of all cases, the last person who drives the car and, and activates the gear shift lever will destroy the person's prints who drove the car prior to and leave their prints on the gear shift lever. The prints made detectives 70 percent sure that Ben Kuzmichev was lying. That wasn't good enough. An inspection of the car seat disclosed another clue. I knew Wanda's stature in that she was five foot four and 140 pounds. When I looked at the seat it appeared to me to be back farther than usual for a woman of that stature to be driving the vehicle. So I placed a female of five foot four, 140 pounds inside the vehicle. She was unable to reach the pedals, which appeared to be a comfortable driving position. Conversely, I put a male matching Ben's description, 5'11", 190 pounds into the driver's seat, and they fit very comfortable. The experiment provided more circumstantial proof that Ben was a liar, but it still didn't prove he was a murderer. 
By now, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police Lab had performed their tests on the trash bag used to wrap the body of Wanda Kuzmichev. The test, called vacuum metal deposition, is a state-of-the-art method for lifting difficult prints from plastic. The bag was placed in a vacuum chamber and then pelted with ions of gold, which cling to the plastic, but not to the oily prints. Then it's exposed to ionized zinc, which clings only to the gold, leaving the prints untouched and in contrast against the plastic. The process revealed a second print on the bag. According to Cynthia Hill, the position of this print was far more incriminating. The second uh, fingerprint that was developed using the vacuum metal deposition proved that he had a direct contact with that bag because the positioning of the hand was in such a way that he would be grabbing the plastic bag, wrapping the tape around Wanda, and he would be the only one that would be leaving the fingerprint in that position at that time. In most cases, that would be enough to win a conviction. But investigators weren't so sure. Proving a spousal murder on fingerprints alone would be a hard sell. The prints and other evidence they'd gathered gave them enough to get a search warrant for the Kuzmichev's home. They found no signs that this was the murder scene. But they did find the Jehovah's Witness literature that the victim's family said she never removed from her car. The items presented more circumstantial evidence that Ben had been involved in the murder. By January 1996, four months after the crime, investigators were still building their case against Ben Kuzmichev. He began to feel the circle of evidence closing in on him, and he announced he was going back to Russia. At that point, police had no choice but to charge him with Wanda's murder. Let me go. If he returned to Russia, he'd be a free man beyond U.S. extradition. Though they had enough to arrest him, they weren't certain they had a solid case for murder in the first. Between the time of his arrest and the trial date, investigators continued to gather evidence against Kuzmichev. Under surveillance in jail, he couldn't make a move without authorities knowing about it. We placed monitoring devices on approximately 17 phones inside the jail at the Ada County Jail. Now, that gave us the ability to monitor his conversations as outgoing as well as whoever he was seeing as a visitor. Uh, the end result was that uh, we received nothing uh, that could be used in court. There, nothing incriminating came about the phone calls. But help came from an unlikely source. Kuzmichev had confided details of his crime to his cellmate. The prisoner, disturbed by Kuzmichev's lack of remorse, reported the details to authorities. He had nothing to gain by doing so. Ben and his cellmate were watching TV one evening when the news media broadcast that we had located a witness who had told us that she had, in fact, sold Ben duct tape and trash bags. The inmate told us that Ben found this humorous, that he had, in fact, purchased from this lady, but they were not the ones that we were looking for that he used in the crime. The inmate's information, though hearsay, provided one more strike against Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators realized they'd gathered all they were going to get. They weren't sure they had enough. But because Ben was likely to be released and flee to Russia, they had to take the case to trial. From what police could put together, four months after their marriage, Ben and Wanda's honeymoon was over. He had been dependent on her money, but wanted to return to his homeland. She refused to go. Their animosity built, and Ben strangled her. He wrapped her body in plastic bags, emptied the trunk of her car, loaded her in, and dumped her in the woods. Then he abandoned the car in the parking lot. 
Based on the accumulated evidence, Ben Kuzmichev was convicted for the second degree murder of his wife, Wanda, and sentenced to 21 years to life. For Detective David Smith, solving this case meant more than simply delivering justice. You do become personally involved. I mean, this guy has come into to your town, committed this heinous act, and now you have this grieving family that you want to do everything in your power to solve this case for. And that's how I personally take it, and I know any other seasoned uh, homicide detective will tell you the same thing. When spouse kills spouse, the clues are sometimes difficult to read. But the marriage of forensic science with good detective work can bring together what the killer had tried to put asunder.